Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Neil and Jordan podcast, podcast where two comedians talk like experts on subjects they are not experts on. We're finally back. We're back together in person. It's been a long, arduous four months having to do it digitally, but here we are face to face with the uh, the power broker of New South Wales politics, <laughs> Jordan himself. Uh, before we get into the podcast, this podcast is sponsored by Crush Organics. Crusher out here as a major sponsor of the show. They've uh, got a vast array of wonderful CBD oil products. They've got the diamond oil, the platinum oil, the daily oil. They've also got a pet blend that you can use for your furry friend. They've got gummies. They've got bath bombs. They've got creams. Go to crushorganics.com. That's crush with a K. Use the code Neil, N-E-E-L, for 40% off. Crush Organics. We are also sponsored by Solid GPS. 50,000, nearly 50,000 vehicles are stolen every single year in Australia. So you need to get yourself a Solid GPS, okay? They're wonderful. SolidGPS.com. Uh, use the code NEIL as well for that one. And it's, it's staffed by Australians. It's all Aussie made and all the reviews are brilliant. And Nathan is also a listener, so shout out to Nathan. SolidGPS.com, use the code Neil. Um, this is our 100th podcast. And isn't it perfect as well to see the progression? that We get into the triple digits and we've got two sponsors, which I really think is the right amount for a podcast. You don't want any more than so that. So thanks, Nathan. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you really don't want any more than that. I mean, what is a sort of product that you think would be an appropriate sponsor for this podcast come on some pickup guide yep <laughs> especially yep, i don't know like scammy this... seminar scammy seminar yeah uh a really a, a cringy what? self-help book yeah yeah one of those ones that has a lot of swear words in it that'd be perfect <laughs> uh and also let's not forget some uh male grooming slash skin care products. Like it's, it really isn't a YouTube access podcast without it. Yeah. I mean, like what? 90% of podcasts that are hosted by two dudes are sponsored by some sort of male skin care. Manscaped. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, Sex Cells was sponsored by Manscaped for a while there. So can't talk too much shit about them. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking shit about them. I'm just saying like, that's the one to go to. Yeah. In fact, is there a podcast that isn't sponsored by Manscaped? I think we're the only podcast that isn't sponsored by Manscaped and uh, a VPN website. I've had offers, but I haven't liked the offers. Really? Yeah. So I turned them down. Like the, I'm really soft, actually, when it comes to emails. <laughs> I'm a little bitch in negotiations. Uh, cave. But, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, but even then, I still wasn't happy with the offers. So if there's a VPN website out there that has a good offer... I'm listening. I'm all ears. And also, come on, some mobile game uh, that's based in the Middle Ages, please. Yep. Give us the trifecta. Dude, I saw, I watched this uh, channel about geopolitics called Caspian Report. It's really good. Can't yeah, recommend it enough. Not bad, not bad. And then he's talking about how there are going to be wars ab- over sand in uh, North Africa in the coming decades. And then about five minutes in, he's got an ad for a fishing game. <laughs> it just lost the, so it. It just brutal. really kind of lost the uh, the tone, you know. <laughs> he like, didn't draw attention to it. Well, it, just, it was like a minute there where he's just like advertising a fishing game. <laughs> it's like you can catch trout and sharks. <laughs> Who the fuck? Like, <laughs> it's really confirming my thoughts about that man being autistic. <laughs> if, if you're gonna, <laughs> he doesn't get that. If you're going to play a mobile game, at least make it some sort of fantasy. You know, you're a warlord or you're out uh, in, in Middle Earth and, and you're going on an adventure. Why the fuck would you play a fishing game? <laughs> like, fishing's already boring as it is. <sighs> no offense, probably lost a few listeners there. But look. They, they would know. It's, it's boring. Yeah. And Boredom gonna, has its own charm, but it's boring. You're going to make a fucking game about it. I mean, at least to get the vitamin D by being outside. <laughs> no. It just right, yeah. It's like Animal Crossing. Just all of these games where you, you're the aim is to do nothing. 
And that seems to be the same with this fishing game. It's, it's well, yeah. I guess catching a fish is an activity, but as you're saying, right, like very little fantasy involved in that. Like you're the beta of video game players as well, man. Like the alpha video <sighs> game players will be playing COD, right? But oh, I don't know. I don't want to shoot people. I think I'll just <laughs> catch fish. Ver- it, it's like, is that something like? Ve- is it like a vegan guilty desire? Like, oh, I've always wanted to fish, but I can't because of my ethics. So I'll just play virtual fishing. Maybe. I'd like to know the breakdown of that because I think you actually could be onto something. And what is the bait, <laughs> you know? Amazing. Is it that, you you know, if you use the appropriate bait, you get the right... Like, who designed this game? <laughs> like, <what is> it? <laughs> <laughs> Look... It's one of those questions where it's like, I don't know and I don't want to know. I don't <laughs> want to f- invest time. If, I don't want to invest time in actual fishing. Yeah, it's, it was just so jarring, man. Like, you're used to all these fantasy games in the middle of YouTube videos and then to see this guy just talking about, talking about a fishing game. <laughs> what is this? I, I like... <sighs> Okay, sorry. I know that we already covered this, but I just need this confirmed one more time. He didn't draw attention to the fact that he was talking about sand wars and then he did a fish. It just went straight into the fishing. No, no, no. There was a few minutes of the sand wars and then... But, but like, the there was no, game. like, hey, I know this is a bit jarring, but here's an ad for a fishing game. I think he just cut straight into it. I think... <sighs> That's that's the most uh, memorable YouTube uh, sponsored ad I I think I've ever witnessed. Oh, I mean it's just the contradiction. It'd have to be in the Watch Mojo top ten. It'd have to be the tonal difference of going from potential sand wars to a fishing game. I, I can't. Yep, can't uh, state how weird that was. By that's the way, sad. I also have to. Uh, I want to give a shout out to a listener. Um, who has made a film. He's made a feature film. He's from Newcastle. His name's Cameron, and he's only 22 years old. He's made a feature film called Cooked. It's a coming-of-age film set and shot entirely in Newey. So you know it's going to be fucking good then. Yeah, I think so too. So uh, go Write check out. You know. There's a Go check out the previews. There, uh, there's a website. There's a trailer. Uh, he wants to build some buzz around it. So I'll put the links in the YouTube description. Hey, did you check it out? Yeah, I saw the preview. It was really funny. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it was good. It sounds like it would be. Honestly, I think that, that like you can't go wrong. Coming of age film in one of the satellite cities of Australia. There's going to be some stories. Yeah, a lot just... of people getting fingered in graveyards there. <laughs> yeah, it reminded me a lot of my schoolies experience in, in Byron. Just the preview. So Yeah? Yeah, yeah. It, it looked... Like a lot of fun. Um, yeah, sick. Good so on you, check man. Check it out. Uh, cooked. And thank you, Cameron, for listening. One final announcement uh, is that uh, the prices for some of the subscriptions have changed. And that is because so many of you have been buying them, which is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's been about a year since we uh, opened up the subscription. So that means if you've been subscribed for, for more than a year, you actually can ask a second question or send in a second topic. Uh, so now that the those are going to start coming in, uh, We'll still, if you if you subscribe, we'll, we'll definitely get to your question and we'll get to your topic. But yes, because of demand, which you, again, thank you guys, uh, up the price a little bit. Bit of supply and demand economics there. <laughs> God, I gotta say, it's this all going is to charity. Like, so. This is a cool hundred episode. Yeah, that's casual. You, we'll keep it casual but, on but this one. Yeah, casual, but also just. It's nice to know that there's been a lot of accomplishment in. Uh, two years of us just kind of filling our lives. Like, kind of just extra time. And look at all this shit that's happened. But yeah, I mean, we're basically and, Like, it's recording. a pretty half-assed thing here, you know? Like- <laughs> hey, look. hey, come on. I've set up a pretty decent... Stu- I've managed to set up a makeshift podcast studio in a uh, one-bedroom apartment, so... Oh, no, I'm... I, like, all credit to you for doing it, but it's not like you were just like, that's it. We're going for this full Alex Jones studio experience. I'm investing my life into this. It was kind of like a, I I can devote a few hours a week to this, you know, and like, and that much has come out of it. It just, dude, it really is like a nice microcosm of something that we keep coming back to on this podcast all the time, which is just like, dude, just start something. 
just start something and good See things happen from there. Commit to it and you'll be surprised. Two years down the track, look at it go. So yeah, thank you for for every for our our day ones. Uh, thank you for everyone who's been listening from the first ever episode. Uh, I look at the trends occasionally on on Spotify and and Apple Podcasts, and it's just been a consistent growth of yeah. subscribers. So oh, that's great! It's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, really can't thank you guys enough. Uh, all the subscription money uh, will still go to entirely to charity. Uh, the the money from the sponsors, from the affiliate sponsors, by the way, we, that will come to us. But yes, the uh, subscription money all to charity. And if you're already subscribed, it won't affect the price of that. And once we've answered your question or topic, you can unsubscribe. There's no obligation. But I just feel, you know, it's if you can afford it, why not? It's going to charity. So yeah, keep the subscriptions coming. Yeah, it's all ups for you. I'm uh. I'm really happy to hear that. You smashed that The only that thing tea. that I can... Yeah. It's, the, the drive always makes me a bit sleepy, so I try and heft myself up on goofballs before I go back. But um, what I will say about this audience when I meet them, anyone who ever knows about the Neil and Jordan podcast that always comes up to me, I'm always really proud of those people because it's kind of like there's two things that always strike out about that, right? Like, okay, because Friendly Geordies is so massive, you're going to come across the occasional freaks. And especially because it's political, you are going to come across those freaks. But when you come to... <laughs> but when is the Neil and Jordan... You have faith in your own audience there. <laughs> Look, it's the... Free... You know what I heard? I'll, I'll go back to this point in a second. Yeah. But you know what I heard recently that I think was one of the top five truest statements I've heard all year? If you are on the fringes of politics, mm-hmm. don't you think that that's more a commentary on your mental health as opposed to your philosophy in life? <laughs> I mean, like every time you ever yeah, meet someone okay. that's a bit it, you know out there you're always just like politics. oh yeah, yeah yeah no you seem like a really put together person you know yeah because the people who get into politics uh you know you see them at uni you see them at school <laughs> they're a bit unhinged and then the people who are too unhinged to even get into politics and just want to comment on it that's another level no comment but yeah no comment but that's you. Yeah. It's, well, it's just a thing. Case of like in you, point. I know. Like, dude, and it, <laughs> it does happen. It does. Like, you just become, I don't know what it is about politics, but you just become a lot more bitter and you become a lot more cynical. And so if somebody's really, really deeply invested into it, especially if they're reading kind of like out, out of the fringe of like the parliamentary system, I suppose, those people are particularly like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> damn. Uh, I mean, everyone is these days. We're we're all in our echo chambers. Well, that's what is like. I this, am. <laughs> we we all are. We all like, are. It, yeah. it's, you we're in our own reality. We're in our bubble. You know what I want to know? Actually, mm. can't even remember what the old point was. Fuck it. But we're the, talking about the fans of this podcast. Oh yeah, the fans of this podcast. Just quickly, I'll say this. The fans of this podcast that I always see, I notice two things about them. The first thing is they're usually well-rounded individuals and they're usually people that you can just sense when you're around them. Like you've got your head together, you know, like you're, you're, you're not fucked. Like you're going somewhere in life. Fred, the Neil and Jordan listeners... Not fucked. Not fucked. <laughs> can we get, can that's it, okay. I've been, I've been searching for a, a, a merch product, some sort of T-shirt. I think we got it. I think it is. Officially not fucked. Not fucked. <laughs> you know what I was thinking? Based on some of the topics we've, uh, we've uh, been asked to talk about, we've had guys who have wanted to start a corporation in order to influence government. Even just in the last podcast, that, that guy, is, his habits were... Uh, incredible like he's, he's the extent to which he's becoming abstemious and committing to a, a positive daily routine at 23 is outstanding yeah we are talking to australia's future elite no i think so too and that's powerful yeah i we're think talking to the future leaders here i actually 
honestly, from the sample of people that I meet from this podcast, I really do think we are talking to the cream of the crop. And they have like a you vibe about them. It's kind of like a, yeah, you went to a selective school. You know? Is like that obvious? Yeah, there's something about <laughs> this. There's a way that they compose themselves. It's a bit, it reminds me of Newtown, but not as dumb. It's like, less less like right. out there and like big personality but like there's 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 a crossover between them you know they're people that kind of they're, they're not part of the normal flow mm. so well, i don't know that's what i get in anyway. nothing but good words you know what yeah mo- in fact all the people who have come up to me and said i really like your podcasts wonderful people yeah everything you said i agree with they yeah. just seem like really nice Normal people. Yeah. Um, as for my uh, general comedy audience, you know what? I'm going to say that uh, they're also cool, but you a- a- occasionally get the uh, Western Sydney bro, uh, which is, uh, and nothing wrong with that. I love having them in my corner. Yeah, that's great. If I ever get in a YouTube drama fight, man, you don't want to fuck with me. Mm. You want to get all of like the Western Sydney hectic bros against you? Good luck. So, yeah, holy shit, your audience versus Isaac's Cronulla Riots round two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, let's fucking go. Let's go, boys. Take down those bogans. Man. Yeah. It's good. It's it's really cool to think about just uh, audience demographics and, and and how I think even the audience for this actually evolved. Because at the start, it was just respectively some of your super fans and some of my super fans. But, uh... No, but that's the other thing. Like, I swear there are people that come up to me and the first thing that they'll say is, I listen to Neil and Jordan. So there are people that that's... it, It has gathered its own demographic. And I like the fact that it's kind of a bit of like a fake club, you know? I like that, that you kind of have to work a bit to get here. That's sick. Yeah, you can't be too fucked. You can't be too fucked. Yeah. It's not like, you, you're <laughs> not going to see it on billboards down Parramatta Road. It's this not... Is the <laughs> not Fucked Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> this is changing the name there. I think it's, it does sum them up. Welcome it really to the does. Not Fucked Podcast. Yeah. Episode 101. Oh, man, it, it is actually pretty cool to think about that. You know what else, though? And this is going to be very controversial, I think. Have you seen Dave Chappelle's new stand-up? Yeah, I was going to see if we wanted to talk about that. I have. And you know what? I'm not a fan. Okay, well, it's not that controversial then. Because I was... Uh, you know what I, You know, you know what it reminded me of? Remember when you said, like, you, you listen to Eminem now? And you're kind of like, yeah, he's still awesome, but like... He's not the hi, my name is Eminem anymore. He's like, yeah. he's a grumpy old yeah. man now. It's getting to that point. I was willing to give him a bit of leeway <laughs> after Sticks and Stones, but the whole thing was strange. The tone was weird. It was half Cornell West, half 1980s Eddie Murphy. But then the, when he was trying to be profound, it didn't feel that profound. And when he was trying to be funny, sure, there were some funny jokes in there, that, but there were pretty basic jokes. It's not like, oh, I'm triggered or anything, but they just weren't that good. Mm. And then his whole point, which was, oh, basically, I can be as brutal to trans people as I want because black people are more oppressed than trans people. It's like, I mean, really? Like, do you want to, like, ascertain who can make the most brutal jokes based on who's lower on the victim hierarchy? I don't know, man. I didn't like it. And I think there's actually now an anti-cancel culture culture that just have these blinders on and any any artist who's being cancelled, oh, they we, we got to hold them up as a martyr and they're brilliant. And are, they, are you actually critically analysing the art here? Because, yeah, sure, I don't want him to be cancelled. <laughs> he should be allowed to make those jokes. He should be allowed to say what he wants, but that doesn't mean they're good jokes. Mm, mm, <laughs> I've mm. actually, yeah, I'm going to make a video about it because it, it, it was... I think he needs to... Um, take some time off he's tainting his legacy i think so too and you know what else like it it reminded me of remember how we're talking a few weeks back about 
uh, social media kind of making everyone worse. I swear to God, that's Dave Chappelle now. He was such a good frog in the ecosystem because you go back to 2003 Dave Chappelle and what he was commenting on then, and I suppose it was like celebrity scandal and all that kind of stuff. It was a bit removed. It wasn't about him. But I think the social media has made everyone so much more internally focused that really, if you think about it, the last three stand-up shows of him just being like, man, that motherfucker came up to me on Twitter, started talking shit to me. And then like, again, and again, just like, and then this motherfucker said to me on Twitter. It's like, all you're talking about is beefs that you had online. Is that all that happened to you this year? Yeah, it's- it's, You got corona? It's sad. It's It's sad. It's, he does just seem bitter and resentful and he doesn't have that fun, goofy- delivery that he used to have and also the the uh the perspective and uh the poignancy and significance of those perspectives are lacking it's just very it's it's the sort of point that you could get on boomer facebook yes it's nothing yes. really that it, it, like, oh, cool I, again i think you should be allowed to make jokes about trans people having mangled vaginas or whatever yeah. but they also weren't that funny yes so it's not that oh, i'm triggered it's just Dude, if you're going to explore these kind of dangerous topics, make it funny. Make it interesting. Bill Burr did it far better in, in Paper Tiger in 2019. Yeah. But I think that a big component of it, because it just seems to be a reflection of what he's talking about as well, is I think that what's really happened there is that, one, uh, social media has made him more inwardly focused. Two, it's made his brain more foggy, as well as age. I'm sure that hasn't helped. But also... uh. I think that he was probably spending a lot of time online. A lot of time just sitting there getting pissed off at like nobody's making comments at him, you know? And I think that that was the missing factor there. Because like in 2003, what was there? It just would have been him going to stand-up shows night after night. But like now he's probably just sitting, especially because it was like Corona or whatever, just sitting there on his phone just being like, what the fuck? And I think that that's like, it, it really was... I, I I don't know. I think I think it's just what's happened to boomers. Like they just they're having that delayed response that we kind of had in our childhood, where we, we we've kind of gone past that, and it takes like a decade or something to even see the light of it. Where you're like, no, nah, I'm not going to check comments anymore. Yeah, and then your life gets better. You don't take it as reality. You just ignore certain aspects of social media. And like it's he said so that true. he didn't, but he clearly did. <laughs> you know, like he's just saying like, hey, I don't give a shit about Twitter, but you do. You made three stand-up shows about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both he and J.K. Rowling are both are just weirdly obsessed with the trans issue. And you know what I think it is? For so long, they've both held up their identity as being part of a uniquely oppressed victim group, mm. i.e. being black or being... A woman. woman. And now that these categories are so malleable and there's the, these new categories that are more oppressed and then, uh, you know, p- giving these rules to the people who are now above them, they can't handle it because they've never had to experience that. They've always been the ones at the bottom punching up in their reality. And now that's completely lopsided. So I think their hatred is, is a form of projection. It's, I hate the fact that I was like that and I still have those kind of aspects in me. Yeah. I'm going to go really hard after the, and also yeah. when, uh, you know, a multimillionaire black celebrity and a like billionaire white author are arguing over who is more oppressed and, and who's more victimized by white men, dude, I have sympathy for like the white guy in Ohio who lost his job and puts on the TV and sees this and wants to vote Trump. I don't blame the guy. Yeah, I know. It's getting to that point. I know. I know. It's sad. It's 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 black activists, uh, net ter- radical feminists in the trans community are arguing over who's more uniquely oppressed by white men. It's just sad. It's just it's like, just live your life. He really was saying what you were saying, wasn't he? But he was just putting it in words that are from his perspective. But, you know, if you said that as an honest summation of his points, 
that was his pod. That, that was his show. His show really was like, fuck this new group of people that are more oppressed than me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still oppressed. What are you talking about, bro? What are you talking- Like, what was your big oppression in life that you walked away from $50 million by choice? Was that it? And now you make $60 million a stand-up show. It's just bizarre, man. It's just- It it, it, it lacks self-reflection. And, yeah, it's disappointing. They do um, really live in, again, their own universe. But it is just, like, because that's what I just realized about him. Like, when I, like back in the day when I used to look up to him as a comedian. And I'm still not saying that I'm better than him. I'm not no, no, no. saying that Me at all. Me either. He's like, one of the greats. He is one of the greats. I don't think he's, and he, at that one point in the special when he's like, I'm the goat. I mean, dude, Shh, come yeah, on. Yeah. You don't say that. I know. I know. I, I think he's one of the greats. Off. I think he's the goat. I mean, like, how is that a joke, you know? That was the other thing. You know what else was like an, a, a thing that he used to be able to do that he clearly can't do anymore? He can't make fun of himself in any way, shape or form. It, it's it's like yeah. he doesn't ever say anything where he's like the butt of the joke. Even anything that remotely true. relates true. to him. Like celebrities, he won't fucking dunk on that really. Like the, the, the concept of a celebrity. Um Black people obviously just doesn't dunk on it anymore. And so now everything, as you said, has lost its like, because again, like when he was making fun of white people in 2003, as you were saying, there was like a, there was a, there was a fun element to it, which was just like, yeah, this is awesome. But now when you're listening to it, it's just like, dude, I don't don't know if you don't know, you're not Malcolm X. (laughs) Like- <laughs> yeah, that's, I was talking to my friend. It's like, what are you trying to be? Are you trying to be a black preacher or are you trying to be the exuberant comedian? Mm. But don't do this hybrid thing. It's 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 Nanette for the other side of politics. Mm. Mm. It's this sort of candid, serious spokesperson slash comedian Telling the truth. It's like now you're no longer com- uh, competing against other comedians. I'm no longer judging you against Louis C.K. or Richard Pryor or Bill Burr. You're now being judged against people like Malcolm X and mm. Jesus. I mean, you can't just... If you're going to be this uh, truthful uh, philosopher, you better be damn good at it. And it it wasn't. The, the truths weren't that profound, at least in my opinion. Nah, they weren't, were they? And what is he trying... I was confused... With the message, is he saying that black people as a group get this special provisional trans joke card? Because that's how it came I, I, across. Yeah, I think it's, that's it. What? Why? <laughs> why do like? Why would the black community exclusively get this uh, ability to make brutal trans joke? What about what about the brown? What, what can I do? Can I just make fun of lesbians and gays? But the line is drawn at. Transsexuals, Trans- maybe, yeah, what, and yeah. then white men can't make fun of anyone in the LGBT community. What? What are these rules, man? Like it's just, dude, it's that's just so bizarre. It is like because you before saying that the idea was there, but it didn't just gel in my mind properly. But really, that's the whole thing. I think he's just built a career off of just like awarding himself the lowest on the totem pole, and therefore he has authority. You're right. Like, he just hates the fact that there's something else there. That's really all he's talking about there. It's how it comes across. And, and again, like, we, we, I definitely still love and respect and admire everything he's done. But it's, yeah, it's going downhill. Having said that, though. Give it up. I, I did like the fact that he was just, not, not for the reasons that he said it, but, like, dude, the phrase punching down does irk me to no end. Oh, I agree and, with that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, that was the but, only thing where I was like, finally, someone says it. But the thing is, but that he is wasn't a uniquely about... comedian problem. Yeah. 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 <laughs> dude, yeah. Why does everyone have a, an opinion on what good comedy is? Okay. You've never, have you ever written a joke? <laughs> you know, I don't go to a plumber. Oh, a, good, a good plumber does it this way. Dude, shut the fuck up. Okay. If, if, if Carl Barron was like, hey, I think good comedy is done like this, I'd listen. Mm. But when Joe Blow says, well, a good comedian doesn't swear, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever done a 10-minute set? Don't tell me what good comedy is, okay? <laughs> I, don't go to, I don't go up to your, you and your job and say, oh, a good accountant deducts these expenses first. Yeah. This is bizarre. Yeah. Why, do, why does everyone have an opinion on what good comedy is? You can have a personal opinion, but... Everyone is the is a connoisseur. Yeah, they're the saying form. objectively this is good comedy, 
And this is the other thing as well. Like, even as a comedian, I can only just say, like, broad things about Dave Chappelle's set. I can't, like, say, if you personally thought it was hilarious, that's great. Like, sure. it, then yeah. it was. Then it was. Yeah, this is, this is, the, this is all our opinion. Yeah, there's this no is objective like... objective truth. <laughs> no, there's no objective truth to this stuff. But it is just amazing when people come across and they give these hard, fast rules to you. Like that, for instance. Like, yeah. you know good comedians don't swear. Well, as we were saying, like, dude, Dave Chappelle's, for what it's worth... It was just an end bomb every like two sentences, lots of fucks, lots of motherfuckers. One of the best sets I've ever seen in my life. Mm. What are you saying that you can't, like a good comedian? Well, because Jerry Seinfeld doesn't. I think that's what they mean. I think they mean like in the 90s, if you wanted a massive TV contract, you couldn't swear much. That's what they're saying. It's like hypnotism. And look, Jerry Seinfeld does his style very well. Dave Chappelle did his style very well um it's just it's strange man and then the whole jk rowling thing as well <laughs> why is she so upset she wrote a whole book about uh one of the the antagonist being a a man who dresses as a woman and preys on girls she's really obsessed with it yeah she can't handle the fact that there's now a a, a class that is more oppressed than her isn't that profound I don't know if it's profound, but I just think it's it's true. It's just no, but it is like it is amazing that it's just this like what is this jimmying on the totem pole when it's like, don't you live in a castle? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Couldn't you buy Hogwarts? Yeah, Why in the in the time of the what... patriarchy, right? Like yeah. that would have been the ultimate. You're living there. Yeah. You're still talking about oppression. You're a self-made billionaire, <laughs> and you still want to like. <laughs> Be the vic- Look, man. Have you ever thought that like our elites today are like really insecure, and it's just sad. Like, at what time throughout history were the elites arguing over, you know, how they were uniquely oppressed by the working masses? <laughs> I mean, I at no. Least, at don't... least, can we have a cocky, pretentious elite, as you would expect? Not this weird, diffident elite that are arguing over Twitter about who's more oppressed. Yeah, I- what is it? Do you think it's actually just a result of the fact that, like, okay, it social media just brings out the worst instincts in everyone, and then you just do real. Like, I think that that might be the actual thing. It's just like usually in your mind you had this idea that billionaires just must be in this super class of their own, and they're these superhumans because they just have so much money. Hmm. You know, like you had that idea, but now you just see them sitting there. Uh, just being like, I'm sorry, but if you weren't born a woman, it's a different experience. You know, like it's. it's- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking. I'm like, I think I'm team trans now. Like yeah. in this particular issue. Yeah. It's like, man, turf, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, he, him. <laughs> but yeah, man, I'm making a video. The video, actually, yeah, the video I'm going to make about this would have already come out by the time this podcast comes out, but. Well, I will not be looking at the comments to that one. That is going to be brutal. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We will see. But Dude, I don't I'm know, man. Like a you. few people, but which side do you think would come after me? Because basically, what I've just articulated then is this is what I'm going to express in the video. I think that the whole which side is going to come after me then? Because I don't know. I'm going to say, well, in, 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 through some bizarre alliance, I think I'm with the trans activists on this one. Well. <sighs> It's just, I think that that's the whole thing. It's just like as soon as you start talking about identity, it just like nothing ever gets more explosive than that. So like, yeah, if if you're sitting there commenting on Dave Chappelle's stand-up who was commenting on other identity, <laughs> like it's so many layers of like landmines, you know? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's get into it. Yeah, well, actually, you know what? On second thoughts, I will be looking at the comments to that because I, I do want to know mm. who's who's defending who. I probably won't be because as Dave Chappelle and J.K. Rowling haven't figured out yet, you don't look at you look at comments occasionally. It's not that I don't read them ever, but you don't take them personally. I've taken some personally in the past. I've learned from it. Okay, you just occasionally glance at them. If people DM, if they email, that's when you uh, read it in full. 
but uh, especially comments on things like Instagram or, or Twitter. Why look at them? What are you going to gain out of it? Nothing. You're going to look at... A you're bad gonna, day. That's you're gonna, what you're going to gain. Exactly. You're going to find the one negative. Where there's gonna be, oh, and it's sad because most of the comments are overwhelmingly positive all the time, but you see the one negative one and it ruins your whole day. And that says a lot about human psychology, doesn't it? And it also, I think, says a lot about the people that currently just are constantly on those social media accounts because I bet you if you went and looked at their social media account, the people that are writing negative comments... I, I would guess that the vast, vast majority of their comments are negative. That they rarely, mm. if ever, say anything positive about anything. Yeah. Look, it's fa- it's a fair barometer, I think, to look at the likes and dislikes. And then if there's a huge amount of dislikes, then I'll actually look at the comments and be like, all right, I've fucked up. What have I done wrong? <laughs> right. But if there's a few dislikes, I don't... I, it's not cool, I did my job. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got, but then again, like, dude, like, also you got when it comes four and a half star Uber rating, that's good. That's good enough. That's good yeah. enough, right? But if it drops to three, then you want to. Oh, what did I do? Yeah, what did I do? But I bet you, most of the time, when you look at that, what you did was you pissed off another influencer who has just bombed your account. No, I don't think that's ever. I don't think I've ever endured that. You've yeah. had a lot of forays with other uh, influencers. I've never really. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have. No, I've never... I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, you've never had a beef with anyone. No, I've never had any beef, no drama. I mean, I don't... It's I'm, fucking good for views, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to... Yeah, I mean, I don't feel like I'm going to manufacture a... Co- I mean, maybe if I go really hard after Dave Chappelle, <laughs> I get him to Holy respond. Holy shit! <laughs> Dude, that would, What a, like... And he might. Wild Because he probably move. spends heaps of time on it. He's probably <laughs> looking at it, Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> he definitely fuck? like hates Candace Owens, and and they both, even though they now agree on the trans thing, but they hate each other. They they were going back and forth in 2020. And Candace he, Owens was yeah because remember when Dave Chappelle did that little serious special? Yeah, in 2020 yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he's like, yeah. and, he's, and he, you know his whole <laughs> argument against Candace Owens was. She got a stanky pussy, which, okay, it's kind of funny when you, yeah, it's hilarious, when you think but, about it. Yeah. But, but, like, what? You, do what Russell Brand did. Okay, he's just gone fully serious. Don't do this hybrid shit. It's weird. It's jarring. It's, it's strange. Yeah, you have to really either declare... I'm serious or I'm comedic. Yeah, you have to, you have to put yourself in one of those categories. I mean, actually, you no know what? No more of this net shit. You do it well. Because that's dude, but you that's, do a different style. That's satire is always built off of like serious shit, right? I think really when it comes to comedians, that that type of comedian, social observations. Mm. But see, this is the other thing as well. Like, dude, when when you're doing that, you're still putting in jokes. I think this is the thing that people like. Th- that's the thing that I think shits me as a comedian when I see that something is like. Ninety percent serious, and ten percent if you're lucky. It's not good enough. Like you can't have yeah. three jokes every ten minutes. It's not high enough hit rate to call it stand up. I don't know why that annoys me actually, but it it does. Oh, it does irk me. Yeah, and 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 it's it's easy to say something serious that everyone agrees with. It's hard to say something serious that's genuinely profound. But again, then you could, you're competing with some different. It's a whole different form of communication. Then you're a philosopher. Then that's, that's you know, there's a whole new hierarchy there. Yeah. But this God, comedian it... philosopher hybrid. I'm not a fan. Of, and I look, I do a lot of serious stuff, but I'm now trying to separate it. You know, Monday's the sketch, Tuesday's the serious video. But uh, that I'm not doing any hybrid stuff. Yeah, I think it's 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 the balance. It's the balance. The balance was off. Because, man, I went back and watched it again. But, like, hmm. God, John Stewart was a national treasure. He really was. Like, coming out five nights a week and coming up with very insightful commentary while also being hilarious the hmm. whole time. No one has been able to pull pull it off since anything close to that man. Mm. 
Mm. I think it's just like what's really happened is Dave Chappelle has moved out of his lane. His lane isn't mm. serious. And the other thing that really shits me about it as well is it's always there's this thing around Dave Chappelle now that he's like the thinking man's comedian. He's not. He's an incredible performer. Uh, he, you know, like delivery second to none. But his joke work has never been very intellectual. It, it just never has. No. It's been hilarious, mm. but those are two different things. Mm. So it's just strange that, like, I suppose that's just what happened. Like, out of a freak of many events colliding, he has taken this kind of immortal pose. But someone said this to me a couple of years ago, and I can't unhear it. Dave Chappelle is, is the black comedian for white liberals. <laughs> like liberals <laughs> in the American context, but it's just like... It's black comedy delivered in a palatable way, whereas Holy Chris shit. Rock and Bruce Bruce and um, Cat Williams, oh, no, they're too ghetto. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's like Dave spells that right amount of hood versus an, an enough hipster in there to be palatable to a white audience. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can't unhear that. Yeah, neither can I. Because I think Chris Rock, uh, like late 90s, early 2000s Chris Rock, I think he is the GOAT. The the because he delivered it in such in sort of just a, a you know a, just a, a acerbic, trenchant, vigorous, uh, vivacious way. He was a performer. He was a rock star on stage. He was energetic. He commanded the crowd. But there were really deep truths to what he was saying. Yeah, and there were interesting perspectives that made you think. And he really hit both brilliantly. And, like, he's, exceptional punchlines as well. Yeah. He has this one audio uh, album from when he was 25, younger than both of us, and it was called Born Suspect. It is incredible. I think it's on Spotify. Listen to the It would have come out in the early 90s. Unbelievable stand-up. Really brilliant. Scathing and just incisive, intelligent. Is it Hard still hitting. when, like, uh, 100% of the audience is black? It would have been in that era of Chris Rock. That era, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, they're just such a good audience. Oh, they? they're just cheering at everything. I love it. It's so good. It's like that way. Have you, have you seen um, George Lopez? Is this, like, this um, American Latino comedian? And they he also gets that kind of rock star crowd. Mm, mm, mm. You know? Mm. Because they, they, like, see, this is the thing that I think has happened. And, yeah, like, when, when you start going mainstream, I think that the whole thing is you can't actually make the points that you want to make. And Dave Chappelle is obviously given the biggest license, seeing as he's given, like, $60 million from Netflix. So they, they've given him the longest leash they can possibly give him. And still, there's a bunch of comedians, I think, saying, like, I can't be on the same platform with Dave Chappelle and leaving, right? So mm. they've hedged their bets, obviously, because everything when it comes to these corporations is obviously just completely money calculated, right? Sure. So they're seeing what, what like, the risk to reward is. But. Yeah, no one's cancelling Netflix for this, but it's generating enough noise to make people go and watch it. Yeah. It's a benefit for Netflix. Yeah. And I think that, like, I think naturally, and they will always say this, but I think that this happens, and I don't think that you or I or anyone listening is exempt to this, but I think that same thing with Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle was a little bit like his audience was starting to get a little more peppered with whites, Latinos, Asians. Like it was hitting a bigger demographic. That was his peak, definitely. Um, but like, you know, like I haven't seen George Lopez, but I'm assuming the same thing. Just probably all Latinos, probably all blacks. The reason that it's hitting so hard is because he's really drilling in on an experience to a slither of society and that mm. is always when things are going to be the funniest like every time i ever see a comedian that's trying to make it in the u.s that they're from australia i swear to god their comedy goes down and it's because the observations that they're trying to make just have to be so much more general and so sure. the, the observations that they're making are just so much more scattershot and like mainstream whereas like you know chris rock doing that it, it, it would have been like 
really, really pinpoint to the black experience in the US, I'm assuming, right? And so he would have just been hitting that audience. And then, like with Dave Chappelle, when he has to move out, as you're saying, like he has to become more hipstery. His points have to be more hipstery to get that. So he's like not really pleasing the black element of his crowd, not really pleasing the hipster element of his crowd. Like, did you see that? Did you see in the stand-up show there was just like two chicks in the center? <laughs> I think did they you did see that on them? purpose. Yeah. yeah. And they weren't <laughs> laughing. They and then at the end, yeah. they just weren't laughing. Why were they there? <laughs> that was the funniest part of the show. It's just when the camera went on them. <laughs> yeah, what the like they must have, surely. Like, why else were they right dead in the center? They yeah. must have been invited. But it's that same thing. It's like you're not talking to anyone anymore. You yeah. just like you're kind of just regurgitating narratives. You're not like breaking narratives anymore. And that's exactly what you're saying there with Dave Chappelle. It's like you're not saying anything profound here. Whereas with Chris Rock, it's yeah. like you were. But then again, with Chris Rock, when he like that period that they all went through of just like oh, Trump, I'm a political comedian now. Yeah, it's like Chris Rock you now weren't doing it. Like is, you, you don't know anything about politics. Yeah, he's a shell of his former self. I will say uh, his latest special on Netflix. Again, it's this. It was directed by Bo Burnham, and he's trying to be half wise sage and half I'm still Chris Rock, and it it just was a strange tone. The second half of that special I thought was really interesting. Uh, his commentary on men versus women, I know it's the most hack topic in comedy, but no one's done it as well as him. His racial commentary at the start was nothing like the the racial commentary of early Chris Rock. Uh, you know, this is a joke where he's like, I got to prepare my kids for the white man, so when I give them vanilla ice cream, I put glass in it. It's like, what? what's the joke? <laughs> Where's the? What's funny about that? Yeah. It's just weird. Uh, but then he's, you know, that quote that's now all over social media where he said, uh, this is a Chris Rock quote where he said, uh, uh, only uh, women, children and dogs are loved unconditionally. A man is only loved on the condition that he provides something. That came from that special. Yeah. No, I remember that. That Which, sticks in your mind yeah. because you're just like, that is a good point. That's a, that is a profound thought. Yeah. Now, they weren't, they were far and few between, but I think there was more of that in that special than there was nothing from the Dave Chappelle special has stuck with me. Except when he just, like, like he does, does a full on rape joke there, and he's still like, I'm Team Tough. And like, radical feminists are like, yeah. And he did a fucking rape joke. <laughs> what the hell, man? <laughs> what a weird alliance. <laughs> I do find it funny when he when he'll transition will he's just, he'll speak candidly like a preacher and then just like revert to hood vernacular and just go from like this is a really serious point about racism in America to like and then I punch them titties bitch <laughs> it's just such a funny juxtaposition yeah I will say that yeah that, yeah, yeah. that delivery in itself is funny uh, well he's but, still got that yeah yeah that will always be that will never not be funny <laughs> no 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 he's he's, mate, he's still like. The the stagecraft is second to none in terms of his his presence on stage. Definitely, he, no one's better. And so, like that, he really is. Dude, isn't Dave Chappelle the living embodiment of, uh, you know, like a punchline is eighty percent delivery? I think that every time I see Dave Chappelle, it's always just like that joke was obvious, but it was still hilarious. You know, mm. and even someone like Chris Rock, who does have very good delivery as well, he couldn't do that. Every time you don't forgive him when he makes a lame joke, when Dave Chappelle makes a lame joke, you're always just like, still good. Yeah, he's very comfortable on stage. It's clear that over the 10 years he took on hiatus, he's changed as a person a lot. Came yes. back really buff and yes. a lot more uh, weathered and <laughs> hardened and tough. And it, it, it's changed his whole comedy. And the style hasn't really caught up with that. No. Nah. So, anyway, look, that's my opinion on him. I don't think there's anything more to really add to the conversation. It'd be really interesting to see how people like Joe Rogan and Schultz, uh, what they say about it. I know Kevin Hart has come out in defense of him, but... Again, defending his right to say those things. Uh, yeah, I agree. He should be able to... Yeah, of course. Everyone should be able to say whatever the fuck they but want. But make it funny. Exactly, man. Like, <laughs> you can't hide behind comedy and, like, always hide behind, oh, they're just jokes. 
but then also have this 70% serious chat in there, well, then it makes the audience question, well, oh, fuck, are they just jokes? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, you know what? I think that that's just the, 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 the takeaway from it was like he got the balance wrong. Yeah. He was too bitter. Yeah. It and it actually work. was interesting because he kept saying it and it was an insight that I completely forgot about in comedy and I obviously am extremely guilty of it, but it can't ever be mean. It can't ever be coming from a place of genuine hatred. Mm, and it's hard to sometimes get that right. Because yeah. the hatred can often be the catalyst to coming up with really interesting ideas and points. Then you do have to soften that and make yeah. it funny. And that's the skill. That's what being a co- comedian is all about. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't He didn't do it. I think Andrew Schultz is the number one comedian in the world right now. I don't watch enough of him. I don't know. Got to check him out, man. He's brilliant. All his uh, jokes about race are amazing he's he clearly knows a lot about every little community his delivery is fantastic he's very he's he's transformed the art itself by integrating a lot of internet content and posting specials just to youtube he hasn't gone the traditional route he's the internet comedian of america but brilliant stand-up as well where a lot of other internet comedians uh may not have the stand-up chops Although that's the criticism always leveled at us by people who can barely do stand up themselves, but he is look like hands down brilliant live. I saw him live when he was here. I opened for him. He's really really good, and I think he's the pinnacle of the art form right now. Okay, well, look, if that's the review, I'll give him a go. You, oh, you have to, man. He's done a lot of good things. I just know him kind of as like this sort of out of nowhere second Joe Rogan, that just a <laughs> massive podcaster from like I, I like barely hearing the name, and then all of a sudden it's kind of just like Joe Rogan gets a guest, Andrew Schultz will get the guest a few weeks uh, later. It's kind <laughs> of like- <laughs> yeah, true, yeah. I don't like his. To be honest, I don't actually like his podcast. Right, he sort of does this. He, I think he doesn't get the balance right in the podcast. It's too wacky. Uh, but I really love his comedy. I really like Joe's podcast. Joe's stand-up is that it's funny, but I don't think he's one of the greats, you know. But what he's done with podcasting is amazing. Um, I think he's actually quite an underrated comedian, but I don't think he's, uh, you know, real top-tier stand-up. Uh, I will say his last special was real. Was actually really good. Um. And he did some jokes, even just some simple ones about cats. Uh, it, it, they were quite clever. And the way he performed it was was good. Uh, if he can come out with two or three more of those kind of caliber of specials, then maybe he will be in that conversation. But I just I just think in, in, in terms of craft work and sort of innovation and creativity and just all the elements of a stand-up comedian uh, plus adding something new and contributing to the uh, evolution of the art form. Andrew Schultz is the top guy right now. I think he's even the com- He may even be. Oh, no, you'd have to ask other comedians, but I'd say he's one of the comedians. Comedians. He's not that real uh, Doug Stanhope type comedians comedian, but damn, that is. You know what Doug Stanhope is, and it's so f- fucking amazing that they're like kindred spirits. I can't even remember what he's known. I can't even remember his name. Oh, yeah. Like, you know who always opens for Doug Stanhope when he's here? Ben, ben Elwood. Elwood. Yeah, of course. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, like, he makes, is Australia's it, Ben Elwood. I mean, America's sense. Ben Elwood. It makes, he's it the makes perfect so open much sense. He is. He's perfect. Yeah, it'll be yeah. Ben Elwood or Nick Sun, for sure. It's just like, and, and, and also, to their credit, big fans. They, oh, yeah. they, they they really do deserve the title of comedian's comedian and they also deserve to be not that famous <laughs> as a result. Like, they, they, they suffer for their art. True. You know? I reckon the comedian's comedian in Australia is Damien Power. Don't know who that is, so that's a good sign. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if you knew, he's not the comedian. He's not the comedian's comedian. comedian. No. He's the project's if, comedian. If you look up Damien Bear, yeah, the thing is he's been on the project, but when he has been on the project, he just goes on these these kind of abstruse rants, and they're, they're actually quite funny to look at. Uh, but a lot of comedians will say he's he's the guy. He's the guy. Hmm. How old is he? The uh, I, I maybe either late thirties or early forties. See, this is the other thing that I'm starting to notice. I think that that's where you're getting to the golden age. I think heyday for a comedian is late thirties to late forties, and I think when yeah. you start getting into your fifties and sixties, you just you get a bit crackpotty. Yeah, you get a bit crackpotty. A little bit fucking can't be fucked to do it. I think. <laughs> yeah, you lose the charm in the twenties. It's all charm and it's all performance. And then in the 50s and 60s, it's just all gristle nihilism. It's just, <laughs> you just hate the world. But uh, yeah, you get that nice Goldilocks zone there in the late 30s, early 40s. Before you go through that first bit of divorce, <laughs> that's, the, that's the golden years of the comedian. It is really interesting. I will also give Dave Chappelle his dues. I think that he's done something for my act. I think is really important in an act. And I think that that is... You have to have a few jokes in there that every night you don't know if the audience is just going to be horrified by the joke or they're going to laugh along with it. Like those jokes where it's just like, if this doesn't land perfectly the next couple of minutes are going to be awkward. Something really fucked up that tests the audience because I think Mm. after that, it kind of just puts everything else to scale. And so a lot of other things where they're just like, I shouldn't be laughing at that. Well, that's already been the line in the sand. So all the other ones, they're kind of... It gives them the other jokes authority to exist. Right. You get the tester jokes, sure. You know, like just something really... And again, mean is the wrong word because it can't come off as mean. It has to come off as a joke, but it has to be something that's like quite sinister, threatening, something like that. You need to set the tone. You need to test the waters and see how uh, far the audience is willing to come on the journey with you. Yeah. But there's also an art to leading up to that. And there's an art in the... The back and forth, the push and pull, which we did a podcast on of live comedy. And fuck, I haven't even done live comedy for months now. But uh, if you go straight into that brutal joke, that's a, it's almost a different joke than if you were to do it 15 minutes into a set and you've sort of led up to that. Yeah, no but foreplay. You, but you also, yeah, it's, it's, you need it's foreplay. sex, man. You need to, you can't yeah. just go in raw in the ass, you know? You can't. That is what it is. It's <laughs> yeah, just yeah, anal you penetration. You need a couple of those in a good stand-up show. You need a, a lot of lube, a lot of foreplay, yeah. <laughs> and a bit of back and forth and a bit of excitement, and then you can do that. Mm. Uh, mm. Then you can get to the slapping. Yeah. But you don't want to start out with that. No. No, that's not going to work. Mm. Mm. And it also, in, in many ways, if the, uh, if the, your prospective partner is, is wild, and depending on the sort of banter you may have had, that's in many ways similar to an audience that might know you for being the dark comedian, for being the brutal comedian. So then you can start a bit stronger. Because if, you ta- if you're too tepid... And if you're too insecure at the start, especially to an audience that are excited and want to see you push the boundary, well, you're going to put them offside as well. So you've got to find that right line. Damn. It is true. Sorry for this, like, 100 episode. This, this would annoy a lot of people that we're talking about these things. But I think that, like, the, the, the overall... They can cop message it. Yeah, you can cop it first off. But I do think that there is a lot of... There really is a lot of merit to analysing these kind of elements of humour because it does say a lot about human psychology. It's one point that I just 
came across while I was on this podcast. It's really cool, like, going back and thinking about this because every now and then something pops into my head from this podcast, but something that has stuck with me for a long time is that you watch a stand-up show, you've, you've really seen where someone's head has been for the last year because they've been spending an entire mm. year kind of like refining the thoughts that they think are the most important and putting them in the way that they perceive is going to be like the most poignant and clever and funny. So it's like a very polished version, which again is why you were just kind of like, Dave, come on, you know, with that one, because mm. it was just three rounds of that. And also it was fuzzy and hazy. So it was just like, it was obvious his mind was just on Instagram the whole fucking year. Um, oh, and I hope he's okay, personally. Yeah, it seemed it seemed a bit like that, didn't it? It was just kind of like sounds like he's in a dark place, if anything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, 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 because he just got. I think that's it. It's just because like, like you hit those online communities and you go at them, and that's the whole thing, right? Like, dude, I don't know how Isaac does it because he is constantly stoking the fires of that, isn't he? Transgender vegan cyclists like all these little subcategories mm. that you know are going to bite back the thing is it once must you, be hard sure but i feel like once you get a rep of being that guy you're a bit more safeguarded than someone like dave Chappelle, who was always a darling of the cultural left who is now dissenting he's 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 a fool being an ostracized by the former tribe whereas Isaac Butterfield was never part of the vegan or cyclist tribe, so true. I think true. there's more hatred when you're when you're leaving that tribe. And you know what? I'm going to hate for this, but I think that's why all those other political commentators hate Dave Rubin so much. I mean, every week Carl Kalinske is making a video cyberbullying Dave Rubin, right? And okay, sometimes it's funny because Dave missteps quite a lot okay but they're obsessed with it mm. him mm. and and sam cedar and uh the young turks just constantly battering dave rubin like dude I know. leave the guy alone like he's public enemy just, number one to them yeah because, and it's just like how, how many views does he get now like why are you so angry at that man yeah he's not even like the it factor anymore like dave uh, like ben shapiro has maintained that position but Dave's sort of harmless now. Yeah, he hasn't gone on to as big uh, to build as big a profile as Ben Shapiro. Um, in many ways, that may be why they they attack him more because Ben's too big to be constantly lampooned like that. Because the blowback from his audience. Well, that and also you, to a certain point, when someone builds that big an audience, you just have to give them. Some due respect. Also, yeah, I think that that's the other thing is that Ben Shapiro sort of sticks to arguments that he can win. And that's, yeah, you're right. Whereas like Dave Shapiro, uh, sorry, uh, Dave Rubin is always trying to justify why he left the left. Yeah, they you know, will. they're just, they're going to hate that. Exactly. And know? that's why they hate it because it's the whole enlightened centrist thing of... Or enlightened conservative in Dave's case now, but <laughs> you know what? I was a lefty, but then I just th thought about it and I realized, no, I'm better than that. I think that's how it comes. Yeah, across. that really. <laughs> and you got to look, lean into it, man. <laughs> you know what? I, you know what I think though. Every time I am I... an enlightened centrist. <laughs> I love <Ugh>. that term. <laughs> you know what? Every every <laughs> time so I pompous. ever watch American political commentators. I feel so poisoned afterwards. That is a truly, it's I really venomous. can't think of another word, but like toxic environment. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's horrible. I would hate to be any of them. Uh, it doesn't bring me any joy at all Still listening to them. I think, and, and the other thing is like on top of that, th there is this constant like, uh, which I think is like p particularly sad. They're always having to, if, if they ever say anything remotely positive about anyone, they're always having to cushion it 
in all of these things. They're like, I, I was critical about them there. And I, I was also critical about them there. They, they always have to bring up that they've been negative in the past. They, they constantly have to be feeding to their audience negativity. There's never, very, very rarely anything that they'll ever say like, that person did a good job or like, hey, here's a cool piece of news. It's always venom. Always. Yeah. Yeah. It it's, just it's seems... Sp it's spiteful. It's hateful. But maybe you could draw parallels to what I was talking about before with Chappelle and, and Rowling, wherein not only their identity, but the consciousness of their audience and, and the commentator themselves is that we are fighting against the powers that be. So then you always have to be critical of the powers that be because if you suddenly say, oh, look, the Biden did a good thing here. I have nothing critical to say about him this week. No one's going to watch that. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm not – like, yeah, again, when I say that because I know there's going to be a bunch of people saying like, they do give props to Biden for like his infrastructure bill or whatever sure. it is, like, right? Like they do, but you notice it. Like you notice that they always have to just be like, but he's also still like a warlord and like all that kind of shit, right? Like they can't even just – isolated and just be like that's so and again i'm just talking about like the headspace that they're in because i i live in politics right like it's a, it's a heavy place to live and to have that on top of it constant wretchedness to it and no one's fucking pure enough I, that's the thing that also shits me is like you know that constant thing of like constantly trying to like jockey as who's the purest out of them but on top of that like they start fucking feeding on themselves yeah. You know, like it's always just fucking chank you talking about how much he hates fucking Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon and like you know, oh, yeah, Jimmy yeah, Dore, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Dore, sorry. Yeah. And then Jimmy Dore and Kyle went at it as well. It you was... know, no one, there's no, no one's holy. No one's holy. Mm, mm. I'm getting the cat off. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like it's, it's again that thing of like. And I think that this is like, this yeah, is another thing when people always just say like, I get the two because I'm obviously in those, both of those worlds. But when people always say to me, either like, you should stick to comedy or like, I like your serious stuff better. It's just like, well, fuck you. Because like, dude, I could not be a straight down the line, serious political commentator. It would make you go insane. And that's the other thing that I think is really interesting about dissecting humor is that it is, as Sigmund Freud points out, like the highest form of ego defense. And you know what else is amazing? You know what else is incredible? I was talking to Kevin Rudd about this the other day, and he was saying the thing that kept me going throughout all of politics and, and kept me sort of sane afterwards, despite the, like, you know, still to this day, no one has experienced as negative and vituperous a campaign as uh, Kevin Rudd did in 2013. Vituperous. Like, just... I like that. <laughs> I don't know. That was, uh, it doesn't mean... What does that like, mean? Just venomous, just another word. But like, but like, then the... um. Love it. And I was just saying that to him. And he was just saying like, yeah, dude, like the, the way that I uh, got through it was just by like constantly reminding myself of how absurd the whole situation is. Everything about it, the conventions in parliament, you know, the, the little like, oh, you got to go talk to the press now. Like all of these weird little transactions that happen. The, the only way to keep yourself sane is to be constantly reminded that like there is a light side to this. It's, mm. you know. Like, otherwise, it's just... He seemed to have that because he was going on the talk shows and radio shows and he, he had that personable side to him. Yeah. It's a very... It's, it's a toxic place, man. But the tragedy is that so many good people are uh, put off uh, running for office because of the toxicity, which is not a good state to be in. Because there could be some quite brilliant leaders out there, potentially brilliant leaders, who just don't want the constant, the, the rampant attacks and the venom and the and the hatred and the and the going behind each other's backs and the Machiavellianism. 
No, it is it's really gross. a place designed to keep out good people. It's, it's, psychopathy would be an adaptive trait. To, oh, definitely. <laughs> to succeed in in politics and media is not too different, actually. No, they're both... They are. Which is incredible. Like, I do like this about the press class because it does say a lot. They're always talking now about how much online bullying there is. And it's amazing oh. because you always just real like, your entire job is, is to, to bully. Is to print bully. To print bully. To... To cyber bully, to send someone insane, spread malicious rumours about them, destroy their reputation, and you turn around and complain about bullying. Yeah. Yeah, it's the pot calling the kettle black in the sense of the word. It, it really is. The sanctimony to stand on the high horse. I think that that's the whole thing that actually we have an advantage of, and I'm very scared about what will come next. But if you did grow up in the internet, you understood the rules of it, which is that anyone can talk back to you at any second. Yep. We are the tribes in Afghanistan, and they are the US yeah. Army, who have much yes. more power, but they don't know the terrain. Yes. They don't know the ins and outs, the little caves. It's so true. It's so true. We'll build a conglomerate and come after mainstream media if we have to. But like, it just the the and look, I don't also want to come across as bitter and resentful because I'm very grateful for the position I'm in to be able to uh, reach tens of thousands of people every week and to do what I love as a career in my twenties. I'm eternally grateful for that, and I try and remind myself of that every day and. For whatever reason, it's just human nature to constantly look at the negative. But what frustrates me the most is that the the uh, the social media stars that are amplified in in the mainstream, or in I think I, I was talking to Isaac about this on his podcast. I don't think mainstream media is the appropriate term. Old media, mm. it's not. How do you define mainstream? Because if it's in terms of overall viewership, well. The, the internet and social media as a whole is probably outdoing them there. Mm. Um, but the, 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 the social media influences that are amplified are the ones that aren't a threat. It's the, it's the jesters. It's the ones that, oh, they just do, they do fun stuff. They're not mean. Mm. I guess that makes sense, though. Makes perfect sense. Think like, about the ones that have been on the project or had positive uh, f- feature featured editorials in the big papers. It's never the uh, the ones that are a threat to their stranglehold, to their monopoly on reality. No, it's the ones that and and Play no exactly offense, into it. and and I'm not throwing shade on the ones that have uh, been offered spots and and. Gain favor with the with old media because I think they are very funny, but they're non-threatening. It's very obvious. Well, actually, this is where I'm going to get quite like men right. But I do see this a lot. If you're a man, you have to be completely harmless. Absolutely no edge to you at all. Unless you go on Sky News. But then you're not really a comedian, are you? Oh, you're just talking about comedians then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're a woman... SBS, Fairfax, ABC will give you all the positive press in the world to sit there and shit can men. <laughs> they <laughs> will. Well, well, because look, the people who run media, the people who are making those decisions, are pre- it's actually predominantly women. Mm. Uh, now mm. there's a f- quite a few industries that have skewed the other way. Hell, even education itself is uh, uh, women are outperforming men drastically. Uh, whether that's a bad thing, because it's hypocritical that, to then say, you know, to to ask for quote. I don't believe in quotas at all. So there has to be clearly something about media, about just education in general, where uh, the 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 aggregate traits of women are adaptive for those industries now. And it, it's not just oh, it's oppressive to men. That's not the right. Uh, that that's not the right um, conclusion to make. I think, but. 
when most of the people making the decisions in, say, advertising, PR, marketing, media, are usually women, or if they are men, they're generally professional class, uh, inner city types. <laughs> In a city latte sipping fucking not that I'm some tough guy at all, okay? I'm basically that anyway. Yeah. But there's there's no one who actually is uh thinking about how can we appeal to blokes in the suburbs. And no. I think that's why so many men are being turned off media. I mean, the perfect example is what they did with the footy show, right? So they try to sanitize it, essentially, and make it more palatable for women. Why? I, I know why. Because it's perceived as this boys club thing, which does seem hypocritical when there are so many shows that are cl- clearly tailored to women and there's no problem about that. But when it's a show just tailored to men, it's seen as dangerous or it can sort of spread a, a nefarious culture. Now, look, if they're getting on the show and like, oh, yeah, check it out, cheerleader, I'd fucking rape her, <laughs> then yeah, but that's not what they're doing. Okay. No. Uh, but uh, so Aaron Molan was um, yeah, given the co-hosting spot of the footy show and it went down the drain completely and they gave it to, and then Ryan Girdle was the other one who was a former player, but then they have sort of very fresh-faced and attractive, both of them, and... They're trying to. I th- I think the 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 corporate people at Channel Nine were trying to make it a more universally uh, um, watchable show. But what they've done is they've just absolutely disenfranchised the core audience, which are footy fans, and not only footy fans, the uh, the most passionate footy fans. And so they all moved to uh, Fox Footy to watch the Maddie Johns show and the Professor, and because that's just funnier. And then and then a lot of people. Uh, Aaron received a lot of negative comments on social media. And then there was this whole uh, argument about, okay, was it sexist? When, with these sorts of uh, social media negative campaigns, sure, you can point to one or two comments by some weirdo who that, that clearly are sexist, but that doesn't, that doesn't, um, you can't describe the entire, uh, the, 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 the substance of the criticism by the worst commenters. And it's kind of similar to what, well, I guess we can't really talk about it, but I think it's kind of similar to what's happening with you, right? Because, sure, you can find one or two tweets here, maybe even 10, maybe even 100. There were so many people tweeting where they were genuinely hateful and they were just like vicious personal attacks. But it's not fair to uh, spoil the whole group of people uh, who are publicly scrutinizing someone uh, by these few bad apples, you're kind of discriminating in, in many ways. Uh, and that's where these people who have come up through old media can't handle social media because they're looking at those particular negative comments. And as I said earlier in the podcast, for whatever reason, there's a human urge to just amplify the, the, the negative comments. And it's something I need to work on. I'll say that. But it's it's unfair to when say 1% of uh, the the negative social media publicity can be described as bullying, to then categorize all of that publicity as bullying. It's completely unfair and it's totally disingenuous. Well, you know why that's happening. It's an excuse. What do you mean? You don't actually have to look at the criticism. You can say, well, it was all bullying. No, there's more Machiavellian elements at play at a governmental level because that Erin chick, she became the face of the Online Security Act. They were like, we need to put this forward because Erin was so... Was that her name, Erin? Yeah. So bitterly discriminated against in the comments and so awfully bullied that she didn't take any time off work, but she felt bad. And because she felt bad, we need to have a czar of the internet that sits there and polices the entire thing. And then the next stage after that, which is incredible, is like, say with this rumor about Barnaby Joyce's daughter with John Barillaro, Barnaby comes out, he says, this is a travesty, 
how could people say all of these awful things about my family? Keep in mind, this is the guy that left his family because he fucked one of his staffers, right? Like that guy talking again about family values, how we must protect this. This is why we need to start policing Facebook and YouTube. And what's even scarier is Scott Morrison is saying those same results. So it's on. And I think they're even going to try and make a campaign out of it in the next election because they can't run on COVID. No one believes them about COVID. Can't fucking run on the bushfires. Maybe they can run on the economy and, and fool everybody with that. But I think that the big thing that they're going to try and do is just pick up on this big Tucker Carlson, big tech thing, which I was really tricked by originally. And I was just like, wow, he's keeping the bastards honest. But really, it's because Murdoch knows that this is a competitor to his grasp on power and so do the liberals they know that which is why they're maneuvering against it now they're encroaching more and more laws onto it and it seems like they're not even done the well, things how, that they've released well how uh how limited is the memory of the populace and particularly the voting bloc of the liberal party because they i'm sure would be more in favor of freedom of speech and freedom of expression than the labor uh constituents i'm guessing but where's the message coming from? Because this is the interesting thing. The internet is still in its infancy stages. And this is what's very, very calculated about the mainstream press. That, yeah, okay, the audiences might be bigger, but they're not centralised. They don't have a narrative punching through them. Like, you know, when Gladys Berejiklian was forced to step down about ICAC, I was looking at the press around that barely any mentions about the fact that she had to step down from ICAC. The mentions that you got was, do we really need an ICAC? What's, what, what's ICAC really doing here? So now they're moving towards getting rid of the corruption commission that pointed out, like, we're investigating you for corruption. No, no now we, we don't need a corruption commission anymore because it's getting out our preferred members of power. So what they kept going on about was just like, she was a woman, she was a woman, she was there when the bushfires occurred and you're still alive, so she did a really good job. Why did they have to put this out now? It was all framed from this, like, how unfair it was that she was taken out. No mentionings whatsoever of why she was forced to resign. And this was across ABC, SBS, Sky, Nine Fairfax. They all generally had the same talking points. Now that it's Dominic Perrottet, and this is really interesting... They're constantly pointing this thing of like, how could you say that he's a Christian? While like the, the the ABC and shit are just like, oh my God, he's only got two women on the board and he's a Christian. Now, the reason that they're doing that is because they realize that those LGA lockdowns in Southwest Sydney have really pissed off the local population. And if they lose those seats, they lose the election. It's the ethnics, man. It's the <laughs> ethnics. <laughs> so now what they've realized is, okay, we can install DOM as the family values guy. The family values guy, the Christian. Yeah, right, right. And that's going to play well to people in Southwest Sydney because they are Christian. And so they're inflaming they're that Christian. culture war. But they're the thing religious. is, they're religious. But the thing is, the Murdoch press is obviously working in tandem with Nine Fairfax to get that result. To like push right. so this audience. So there's like this invented. So the Guardian is saying, well, he's, he's you know. Well, he's he's a man and he's a Christian. Yeah, and he has six kids. Which you know, what what's wrong with that? But yeah, um, the Murdoch press are saying like, oh, he's being hard done by because he's a Christian and he's right wing. Yeah, so they're playing this kind of fake, uh, a fake disagreement when really they're just trying to get their various uh, tribes to. Uh, to, to to blame some other tribe in this culture war debate. Which and, plays and deflect off deflect the blame of which deflects the blame the government. And this is what's happening now because like you're seeing uh Scott Morrison going into the Sydney Morning Herald and saying in the Sydney Morning Herald, um you know, we 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 can't have this 
uh, malicious online bullying and how bad it is, the defamation. Keep in mind, these are the same fucks that have been talking about freedom of speech for fucking 20 years, all of a sudden on a dime. Now I've got a more nuanced opinion now because, like, the free speech is against me and it threatens my seat. So we're going to have to go down to police it. And you see Barnaby Joyce saying the same things in the Sky News press. So it's just, again, like, it's... They're maneuvering the messaging and the overall messaging is we're going to clamp down on social media. Well, I hope because because freedom of expression and free speech has been such a strong point for which maybe even some people turned uh, who, who have been lifetime Labor voters and are maybe socially conservative who then went to liberals in the same way in America – it's Latinos that are actually changing from Republican to Democrat the most. I would hope the average Australian can see through this blatant hypocrisy. The I would party hope so that too. Was just, just three years ago, obsessed with freedom of speech and freedom of expression, and now want to clamp down on that because it's always mean. I would Man, also hope so, but fuck off! Like harden up. <laughs> isn't it amazing? Yeah, and you know what it is as well. This is really. And I'm going to get a lot of blowback for this. But I was just looking recently at uh, like ABC news shows and you go from the glass house to then like Howard doing his like little clamp down on left wing shows, which meant shows that were critical of him. And then conveniently in that year, that show got axed. Uh, Howard denied that he did it. Which, you know, like, it's like a fucking mafia don. Like, the mafia don never orders a hit. He just kind of raises an eyebrow and everyone knows what that means, you know? But those left, if they're culturally left-wing, they actually play, I don't you think they it's play in-, in the liberals' hands? Because, like, it just makes, it makes working class people so pissed off at the, at the you know, latte-sipping elites. Because they feel like they're constantly being talked down to and they're constantly being blamed for everything. And they're just not allowed to make jokes and just the classic... Uh, gripes that uh, many uh, working class and and you know what middle and up many just normal people have with the with the media and for whatever reason uh, and maybe this is a it, it is a brilliant move by the Murdoch press they've associated that culture with with uh, well Labour Greens so if you're against political correctness if you're against wokeness and cancel culture. They've made that association there, so I guess I got to vote liberal then. No, that's like you. You have put the nail on the head, but what's interesting is like it didn't used to mean that, and this is what's really scary about our generation is this thing of like, okay, you've seen through what the current state of play is, but this state of play didn't exist even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it, 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 this didn't exist. This is a constructed paradigm that people are supposed to see the world in because it benefits the powerful. Whereas with, you go back and you watch The Glass House, it's incredible, like it's just down the fucking line. You watch The Glass House, The Glass House was sitting there doing exactly what I do, just like exactly what I do. I was just like shocked. I was like, how the fuck was I allowed on television? Like it was, it was insane. It was just Will Anderson sitting there just being like, these IR reforms are fucked. Like his new anti-police, like his new policing laws and anti-terror laws that he's putting in terrifying. Um, you know, like his, his new sedition laws. He's trying right. to make sedition a crime again. So it's moved more towards cultural criticism because then that plays in. Well, then the, the, the next evolution after that, which was this was truly the genius of Howard. And I need to talk to more people about this, but I've been talking to a few people that saw this transition happen. But it was it was like this thing of like Howard realized that you need to shift it into a culture war. So he got rid of like that substantive criticism is completely gone. You want to see a comparison of that? You go watch The Glass House. Go watch it. Like, it was, it was a fucking hilarious show. Like, it was really funny and, like, scathing criticism. Like, really uh-huh. well done. And then go watch Will Anderson now on his ironically entitled show, Question Everything. And everything's just about TikTok and anti-vaxxers. And, <laughs> right. You know, like, this, these new social RV Yemeni types. You know, like, it's all that kind of stuff. It just like, doesn't affect the liberals at all. doesn't affect power at all. Just 
oh, this is that's a funny little fucking dance video that's come out. You know, like well, it's all that kind of stuff. I think more ethnics are actually they they're not falling for this. Okay, the people in Western Sydney aren't that stupid. That's what they're probably listening more to. Uh, Avi and that, the, the, what's his name? The guy who's now made him, Rukshan. They call him alt right. He's got a fucking Indian accent. <laughs> oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah. The, the age was like, this is alt right guy. <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's, he's got an Indian accent. <laughs> that alt right term is just thrown about. Like, it, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's such a dumb term. They've, they, they, it's the media that cried alt right. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't have a wide appealing message. Who doesn't have a wide appealing message? The liberals now, because I don't, because people are really dismayed at how they've, I mean, I don't know if I'm in an echo chamber, you see, I don't know, because I would, you know, I talked to some of my friends who I would have thought, okay, look, they're in banking and they, you know, you, you, I would have thought they would have voted liberal or something, but even they're like, no. Nah, they fucked up the 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 pandemic and stuff. So it's too hard to predict now what is going to occur because everyone is just in a little echo chamber. I think definitely, I think One Nation could win like f- five to six seats in the next in the next Senate. It is possible, but this is the whole thing that the Liberal Party has geniusly set up, which is all of these preference sponges. So you've got your Palmer United, you've got your Australia One, you've got your United, uh, mm. your One Nation. All those preferences go back into the Liberal Party. Yeah. So that's what. But Senate, though, because like, yeah, I don't think they'll win a House seat, but but like this is the whole thing. Like really, they're just. What is the difference between United Australia and One Nation? United Australia really just sits on the, they're both fucked. Fuck both parties. It's just positioning. Same thing with One Nation. It's mostly just like, what happened to fair dinkum Australia? It's not here anymore. End multiculturalism. But you go look at how they vote in the Senate and it'll be like 90% in the same way that the Liberal Party votes. Like, if you're talking like right. they're the same, that's the real they're the same. Like, it's those preference sucker votes. And they understand this uh-huh. and they don't hurt the Liberal Party. They kind of just morph it around and give it more avenues. So, they're just creating, like, a wider coalition. than Like, before it was just, like, the Bush and the city. That was, like, the Liberals and uh, the Nationals. That's what it was for the last hundred years or whatever. Right. Now, it's just going to be, like, the Bush, the Burbs... Fucking regional Australia, like it'll, it like you know, the Shire, like, sh- the Shire oh, yeah, party, right, right, right. So like all that different shit. Marketing on the same platform because this is what people like. Okay. This is an amazing. Okay, yeah. Why doesn't Labor do that then? They've done that effectively with Shooters Farmers Fishers. Why don't they do more things like that? First of all, they don't have the funds. But this is the other thing that I've realised, which I'm really come, scared come the fucking frame. shit out of me. Back this way, maybe. There you you imagine that the Labor Party has this huge machine running behind it with all these nerds sitting there c- tallying all of the numbers. They just don't have the money. They're, they're like so outspent by the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party has this incredible machine running it. And Cambridge Analytica, this is where it gets really scary. Cambridge Analytica, which is what the Liberals have access to, gives the Liberals insights into exactly what everyone is thinking at every second and where they need to get those votes and where those votes are coming from. So it's a a completely rigged game now while the Labor Party is just sitting there. Like Michael Daly was telling me this, that in the last election between him and Gladys Berejiklian, he was down in the same seat that Gladys Berejiklian was that day. He went out to the, uh, uh, where the fish kills were and he was just saying, this is fucked, look at this, right? Like, Mm. and that's a powerful campaign and it should be a powerful campaign because it's, Terrifying. But Gladys Berejiklian was there. She completely ignored the fish situation. She went into this tiny little scout hall filled with these old senior citizens. And then she said, I'm going to clean, I'm, I'm going to put, you know, a $50,000 grant into bringing this fucking scout hall up to scratch and left. And Michael was scratching his head at the time being like, why was she doing that? just seems so odd to spend a day out just to go there and then go to another completely different part of the state. And it was because Cambridge Analytica said, 
you influence these people, these people talk about politics, they'll do the politicking for you. Wow, this is, they don't know that much about who influences who. Yeah. So they probably have data on who's listening to us or watching our videos and can say, all right, these people influence this demographic and these people influence this sort of voter. Yeah. Yeah, it's next that's, level. That's powerful. It's powerful. And then the other thing is that they are also just clamping down on the, the first time in human history that the plebeians had a medium yeah. to express themselves. Yeah, yeah. And that's going. And so, like, it's just this amazing technological disproportion that is happening in our lives where you will see them with, like, godlike powers of communication and convic- and convincing. And then us, closed. So it's like it, it is a, it is a very very scary time that this is all happening, and so it does, and and it does really. You got to move. You got to you got to start your uh, business in a different country where the laws aren't as restrictive, but still comment on Australian politics. It, it might actually come to that case. It might actually come to that at some point. You might actually be onto something there. But they've. Uh... Well, why not? Be digital nomad. I'd be kind of mad living in like a Middle Eastern country and just being yeah. mega rich, but just every day reading the Australian news. <laughs> I would I would love it. I really would if I had to just travel across the world as that. That does sound like an ideal life to me. <laughs> not bad, eh? It's not bad. Oh, but it's, yeah. And even personally, I mean, I, I, I always did think you can't fall for just for platitudes, right? When a party just says, oh, we're the free speech party and we're against wokeness, <laughs> which okay, I'm against those two things. Well, I'm in favor of the former and against the latter, but what do your policies actually show for it? Nothing. In my very uh, cursory foray into the legislation of Australian politics, just this year, online safety bill... Uh, identify and disrupt there's nothing philosophically liberal about these there's there's nothing about individual freedom there these are deeply authoritarian laws so it's liberal in name only and the only right-wing outlet i could see that were uh honest and, and consistent about that were actually i think the spectator and I think they had an article about you as well, where they were they they were quite principled in in saying, "Look, I, I don't, the typical oh well, I don't like what he says, but he has every right to say it." Hmm. Uh, but yeah, all the who other... runs the Spectator? Because they do make those kind of well, they're the like, principled think pieces, don't they? To me, they're the principled right wing, where I get like pr- principled right wing content, and then the other ones you've recommended are where I get. Principle. I know we don't like the left-right labels, but the the other narrative, if you will, you mm. know, Michael Weston, Independent Australia, mm. but the whole the the news, and even Sky, Sky News, I watch as light entertainment. It's just funny, <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't try and be uh, accurately informed by any of the major papers, uh, or any of the major TV stations. And I think that that's really. I'm glad that we live in that age where you're at least able to get that message across. But I think that that, like, I, I honestly think that that window is closing. I'm gonna, gotta do what you can. We got, we got to do what we, we can then. Um, what, are, what sort of laws could they actually implement then? Could they actually have some sort of standard, uh, some sort of, you know, classification board and integrity board that says hey if you have a certain amount of followers or if you have this x amount of influence you have to abide by these standards and these codes Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's getting well i'm i'm 100 percent leaving the country but the thing is you know what else is really really scary about all of this is that they are using australia as a testing testing ground ground. so like it will be worldwide after this 
Well, you know, like all of this stuff is always just in a lag time. Like the stuff that they're hammering out here, you'll start seeing brought out in the US. You'll start seeing brought out in the UK. But th- this is the testing ground. This is the first zone because this is where Murdoch has most of his influence. And th- that really is who is behind this. It is the traditional media and the traditional power base of the Liberal Party that were trying to get that. Okay. What I should actually do is just, even though, like, I know that it'll just all these people just really screw me over on this, but like, I really been. need to just explain to people that, like, you can imagine that there's all these different parties and there's all these special minor parties, but really, they are all just marketing to your identity. Yeah, and and That's like what a political party is. For, yeah, and really, there is just two blocks. Like in every parliamentary system since Rome, two blocks, one that represents the oligarchy, one that represents the rest of the population. Now, you can get into the stage where it comes to the Democrats, where they just get so influenced by the oligarchy that you pretty much have two parties that like start to get similar there. But it's n- like there's still competing forces in that other block, you know? And so, yeah. like, that's that's really what it boils down to. And anything after that really is a swindle. It really fucking is. So, I don't know. It's just like, I think that that's... What about the old, uh, what is it, the Centre Alliance? Uh, isn't he helping, isn't it somehow tied to your uh, legal case? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the other thing as well, right? Like, okay, in in uh, in, in the Senate, you'll get your little independence... But those aren't the same as micro parties and those independents, if you look at them, they will be voting one way or the other, which re- like most of the time, which really gives you it's it's again, they're falling into those little blocks. Right. I think this is something that people just like it is a. OK, so if you can if you can uh, if you have enough influence and if you've been in the game long enough and you can see that there's a certain portion of the populace that are dismayed at the usual party that be, that they would be voting for you can come out as a, whether you want to call it a con man you can sort of come out as maybe even a sophist and say well i'm going to appeal to the disgruntled you little block here this little block here that is just would usually vote liberal but i can see that and there's this one issue that you're uh, disgruntled at the liberal party about and vice versa to labor i'm going to come out and and latch on to that that's essentially what you're saying. So Craig Kelly with his or UAP or whatever with his stupid YouTube ads are trying to hit that market. That is That's- exactly who Craig Kelly is hitting. Exactly. Is it working? Because to yeah. see, see, some of them I see through it. I'm like, this is just so. This is such pandering. Yeah. But I again, you know, you just don't know if you're in an echo chamber, man. I no, you are. But this is, this is the thing. Like the UAP. Aim for the dumbest, most uneducated people in the country. Okay, do you think that sentiment actually is what pisses some people off, though? Yeah, of course. Like it's, but I'm just saying, like it, it, the, these are just stats, right? Like it's just okay. like saying, like the Greens are the richest voting block in the country. Sure. That is indisputable. Like they have the most amount of money. You look at the UAP, least educated, least educated by a mile. Uh, the 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 reason that they are is because it's, again like if you if you have just a, a a modicum of understanding of the political system like you can see through the united australia party but if you don't what are they doing they're always hitting those kind of messages they're both the same fuck the main two parties very broad concepts like fuck cops freedom of speech Nothing actually concrete. And like I just did a video just pointing out what a hypocrite he is on all of those things anyway. Like yeah. and, and the big one, the big, big, big one, vaccines. So he was really going yeah, for twenty like percent of the population that didn't want to get the vaccine. Yeah. And he's he's but like the liberals couldn't say like couldn't yeah, allow that so. message in the Liberal Party because that would have pissed off the other eighty percent. So Craig was just like I've got 20% in the bag here. Yeah, and where they would maybe differentiate from One Nation is that, well, if you're looking at a majority Muslim population in Southwest Sydney, they may still be a bit hesitant to vote for Pauline Hanson, whereas (laughs) uh, 
they may be more inclined to vote for a Craig Kelly type of character. Hmm. Hmm. That's what they're looking for, right? Like, because he's not going for the like fuck immigrants angle that One Nation is. No, because a big part of the uh, the the anti vaccine hesitant, vaccine skeptic, whatever you want to call them, is that they are very ethnic. At least from what I can see on social media, again, don't know if I'm in an echo chamber, but uh, it seems to be that it's quite working class and quite ethnic. Traditionally what would have been a labor base. Hmm. Seems to be. I don't don't know this for sure. I'm just uh, guessing, again, from what I'm looking at on social media. But um, it would be an interesting. It w- it would be funny if there wasn't a UAP and there was the the, the only party that was saying sh- that was just fervently against vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. Which, by the way, I don't actually. I don't agree with passports. I don't even know if I agree with mandates. I don't see. I don't really. It's a it's a tough one there. But there should. I do actually have something in common with that sort of group in that. There needs to be a space for conversation there. Yeah, yeah, no. Like, uh, see, this is the but this is the whole thing, right? Like, you are not going to change your vote over that, but there are people that will. You know, that's who sure. he's aiming for. Yes. But as you're saying, right? You're just saying, like, I think that's everybody. Everybody is kind of like, I'm generally unhappy with how lockdowns, how vaccines, all of that. But they're all unhappy for different reasons. But because they're educated enough, they realize, like, but this is the game. You know, like, they, they have enough sure. of an understanding of where the parameters are. Sure. But there are people that don't. And if you just poke that one button over and over and over and over and over again, you're going to get that demographic. Because that's the thing that is really shitting them at the moment. Because, again, like... What else is actually... De- this is the other thing as well. This is the thing that's very frustrating about politics is that, like, it, it screws you over, but in invisible ways. You'll never actually see it. It'll never happen in your life. Hmm. Vaccines did. COVID did. Hmm. And unless you're sitting there reading the 300-page legislations that they're actually passing, you can't trust the messaging of any of the... Parties really well. They're all going to make themselves sound good. They're all going to say, "Here are the great policies that we're uh, putting forward." Uh, un- un- until you actually start looking at, all right, this party passed this law, this party voted against this law, then you get a true gauge of their their character and their ideals. I mean, in on those two laws I was talking about earlier, the Greens were the only ones that both voted against them. Now I'm going to guess. I don't know. If, you can confirm with this that Labor didn't go against it because they didn't want to rattle the Murdoch boat. And they, because if they went against that identify and disrupt bill, then there'd just be a smear campaign against them. I'm going to guess that. Identify, usually, yes. No, okay, l- let me let me actually break this down. Actually, uh, when it comes to anything that's like anti-terror, there is an agreement between the two major parties that anything on national security, anything on budget supply automatically gets passed okay. because otherwise you get a situation like Gough Whitlam where you can just say, nah, block everything in the Senate until you cause a crisis. Um, okay. And that's really poisonous for democracy. So there was, there was that agreement. But when it comes to identify and disrupt... Identify and Disrupt was its own little beast. That was definitely the CIA. There's about 10% of those anti-terror laws that they all start linking up together. And that moves into pretty much that the US has a Bill of Rights that stops them from spying on their citizens. Again, because Australia's a little test beacon, which is just like AXIO is the CIA. Like It's pretty much just an Australian taxpayer-funded branch of the CIA. Uh But they are allowed to spy on... But ASIO is allowed to spy on US citizens, so they could pass all of these laws that completely erode Australia's civil rights and yeah, yeah, spying yeah. and stuff like that, so that they can then use those laws on American citizens. And we're just kind of like the, the fodder in the mix of it. When it comes to the Labor Party, yeah. 
everyone knows the playing field and the Greens definitely know it as well. It's just that they're not trying to win government. They're just trying to win good boy points from their yeah, little okay. demographics so okay. they can sit there and say like, we're against these things. But the Labor Party is trying to win government when the Australian federal government isn't the emperor of the universe. The emperor of the universe. It's not even built B- Joe Biden. Like, I don't even think Joe Biden has anything to fucking do with this. Right. I don't think Trump does. This is CIA. This is another level of government, right? Wow. And they're the fucking ones pushing that. So it's just like, I don't even blame Scott Morrison for identify and disrupt. Okay. It was yeah? strange, though, seeing the rhetoric of... Uh, what some of the green senators were saying about one online safety, but also identify and disrupt, talking about things like civil liberties and 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 freedom of the Australian constituency. Because if you listen to any of the major news outlets, they're always ragging on, say, "Oh, the Greens," you would think would be against that sort of stuff. So you can't trust anything you, you hear in the media about Australian politics. You got to actually, and no one has the time to do this, but this is what you do. This is what I'm going to try to do, but I also don't have time to do it. But you got to look at like, you know, read the the re- recount of what every senator said when a bill was being passed. You got to look at the details of a particular law, law. And when you don't trust the institutions that are supposed to be doing that and supposed to be informing you, well, you, you create chaos you create uh, you create the conditions for a lot of con men and uh, as you say identity driven parties to come in and uh siphon off little sections of the population and you know what else is really scary you just won't ever be able to get that message out this is the other thing that I'm starting to learn is that you, like all of this is kind of a bit in vain because there's no way that you can influence other people. Sure, that's fine. But as you're kind of pointing out, right, like no one in South West Sydney is fucking listening. No way. They probably might be not. listening to their shake, you know. Yeah. That's probably where they're getting their political messages uh, the, from. The, the episode I did about uh, Charlie Hebdo. And I'm praising yeah, Emmanuel no, Macron. You cooked your goose. Yep, that was, no, <laughs> that, that lost all the South West <laughs> Sydney listeners. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. You blew it. And I think that that's that's it. Like, dude, if you, if you are going, as you said, if you're going outside of your identity, yeah. outside the parameters of that, you're, you're an intransient visitor and you can, the best that you can hope for, I suppose, is being a Dave Chappelle figure where the things that you were saying wow. are just not that insightful. Full circle, because you, you're not wrong when it comes to political commentary as well. People will trust people who embody their identity and their ideals. And the more you try and become universal, uh, the less trustworthy you become to that core audience. So, well, that's really what Murdoch worked out. And, and he said, well, I'm going to create this little branch here that appeals to the identity of this these people and this little branch here that appeals to the identity of this people. So you need a whole network. You need the capital to have different YouTubers uh, that appeal to every little demographic group, which are just const- constantly uh, breaking apart even further now and, and falling into even more niche uh, cultural tribes. Uh, and if and if you can sort of have some sort of network that uh, uh, offers a respected figure for each of those tribes, that would be the 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 emperor of new media. But good luck. I think that's it. That would be. But again, this is the other thing. That's one part of the puzzle, because the other part of the puzzle is. You don't have access to the data that they have. And now I'm starting to understand why data is the oil of the 21st century. Like, how much money is there in knowing what people are thinking? Like, that's that's scary. I know. I know. Like, just the... Because everyone thinks personally, well, I don't want someone looking at my porn searches. It's like, 
Uh, it's not about that. It's about the aggregate trends here. It's the aggregate chain. Yeah. And, but also, like, no, I don't give a fuck. Not if just ASIO's looking at my who pool. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, if they're watching me beat off, like, it's no skin that. off my nose. I hope there's some graduate at the uh, fixated persons unit that has to look at your porn searches. Oh, and they <laughs> will be for sure. <laughs> like, that's their new job. <laughs> you want to make it in the fixated persons unit? You got to sit here, look at what Jordan's searching online. <laughs> yeah, I'll just tell you now. Like, a lot of oil. A lot of anal. Like oh. that's- <laughs> so it's like, dude, I'm, I'm still in the Brazzers era. That, that's me. I thought the, like, hey. I don't think porn peaked. The, uh, it's that it's that real question. It's just like it definitely didn't peak in classiness. That was when they had budgets for like storylines. Hey. And like the chicks used to look like they were like from Victoria's Secret. But then it got to that period where it's kind of just like, I used to be a stripper. It was that, that like, <laughs> 2010. Yeah, just, you know, the quality waned. They were just going for quantity too. <laughs> yeah. Like Netflix comedians. Before, the ne- the ne- being a Netflix comedian was really respected. And it was a, it was a, an indication of, of you... Uh, of your high position in the hierarchy, but then they gave specials to anyone and everyone. Also to try and get each niche audience that the comedian has to come to Netflix, to come to the monolith. Uh, So, wow, this trend is everywhere. Trying to consolidate tribal groups. Damn. Dividing, well, conquering the already divided. That's the new empire building. (sighs) It's it's uh, finding each of the uh, the digital subcultures and and bringing them all together unknowingly, so people don't actually realize that they're all part of this big network that's trying to pass the same laws and do the exact same things. But because they've got their one respected mouthpiece, they don't realize. I mean, it's not that profound because you look at cable news and you could clearly see. Particularly in America, all right. Each anchor there is appealing to a different type of person. So you, Chris Cuomo, who's now, as he like grabbed his female boss's ass or something, and said, "Hey, now that you're not married, I can do this." Like the guy's just a, him and his brother. What the fuck? Wait, wait. So Chris Cuomo's <laughs> out? No, but they're not. They're protecting him. They're just total hypocrites. Are they? Uh, I don't know, man. I just get this from breaking points. But um, he appeals to, I think, middle-aged women who just like it because he's, he's a very confident, stoic, masculine man. Uh, and then all the, you know, Megan Kelly appeals to, like, cucked conservative men who are like, she's hot. <laughs> and Tucker Carlson kind of appeals to, like, 20s particularly appeals to younger conservative incels i think you can tell because like out of all of those characters he's the one that brings a smile to my face he uh, he can yeah, he, yeah he's the demographic that like you can relate to for some i really don't know what that reason is but he does i agree yeah uh of all of them i resonate with him just on terms in terms of personality the most you know what i think it is it might just be the smugness yeah because he's he's, <laughs> he's, he's also not too hard line and stoic he's also got a sort of affability about him uh i'm trying to think who else would there be and then even when you look at those political commentators we we're talking about earlier right jimmy Dore appeals to that you i'm guessing Male uh, unionist who's disgruntled yeah. with all the identity politics that's now become ubiquitous on the quote unquote left. Dude, every time I think about his audience, I just think about a bunch of guys on a construction site and at a wharf. Yeah. 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 Carl Kalinsky. The like educated left. <laughs> but also, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But a bunch of like college that, students. Yeah, middle ground. Like students. male college students who aren't as rough as the construction workers listening to Jimmy Dore, but aren't as cucked as the people who listen to the Young Turks. Who the fuck is listening to the Young Turks? It's, it's sad Who's looking at their views. looking at them now, yeah. 
Who I'm trying to think. And who also, just like when they, when, yeah, like dude, every video that I watch of them, I'm always just like, wow, you just don't get it anymore. How the fuck did that happen? You were such a titan for so long, and like, y- your audience is just gone. Yeah, they they don't have a point of difference to mainstream media. They tried so hard to compete with mainstream media that I think, well, old media, but they, that. I saw a comment somewhere where they're no different to MSNBC now. It's just a bit more fucking budget. (laughs) Yeah, and youth-oriented. But, like, not hitting the fucking mark, you know? Like, it's just like, Chank should be on MSNBC. He's, like, easily that age. And, like, he's also just going for the whole, like... You know, graphics ridden wall behind him, which now just comes off as so fake. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they've really fallen from grace. I wonder if they still get views. I don't know. I don't know how they're going. I don't think they, like, I look at their views and it's just like 30,000, 20,000. Every now and then they'll get 200,000. But you, you, you look at, you look at how many um, subscribers they have. Yeah. It's like one up from a dead channel. Jimmy looks like the one who's gaining the most traction out of all of them in terms of views recently. And I think that split. that's yeah, I think that's because he just started waging a massive and I've got to say it did even though I was just saying before that it's just such a negative environment. Like it did it really feel good because there was there was always something and I can't put my finger on it, but there was always something deeply offensive about the Young Turks. <laughs> like I always just like I was always just like fuck off Chank like fuck off Anna like you just they, they're not likable there's nothing ridiculous even when it comes like the rest of them they're all whiny but there's something a bit forgivable about Jimmy Dawes whininess or Kyle's whininess yeah Kyle's lovable yeah. it was when they got into that fight into that escapade and Kyle was saying man I'd punch him in the face that was that was funny I can't see you can't see Kyle it. being that aggressive guy. No. Whereas I could probably see Jimmy getting into yeah. a scrap. Just, <laughs> just even the fact that he was, what was he phrasing? Something like, I'll punch him in the face. Like he actually said something like that. Whereas yeah. like, you know that if Jimmy Dore was saying something like that, he'd be like, I'd knock your fucking black off. And it's like, <laughs> that guy has like fucking punched someone before. Well, probably. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, you know, yeah. you're using words like that. <laughs> I really like breaking points, man. I um, I don't know why that took the world by storm. It's something about it. It's just the way they communicate. It's uh, it's it feels real. It feels like it, yeah. When you actually try to think about well, why, it has this. In I think it because it has this enlightened centrist vibe about it, which now you could kind of be a con about. You can say, well, I look at both sides critically, and I choose the best option. And that appeals to people who are uh, have have uh, identify with the, the the deep thinker and the non ideological kind of person, uh, which you want to try and emulate, sure. But you can also then become part of that new tribe of just this the the anti woke, but also anti conservative right, and just in the enlightened center. And I think they, because they've got Crystal, who's uh, expresses the same kind of economic sentiments as the rest of those uh, uh, left wing YouTubers, but does it in a much more charismatic way. And she's also fucking hot. <laughs> but, well, two things. I wouldn't go as far as to say charismatic. I would say congenial. Congenial, and, is and a I good wouldn't, word. and I and I would say used to be hot. Something happened in the last six months. I think she turned forty. Don't you think like it's just oh, like like I, I, she's still hot, but like I just remember when she first came out and I was like, "Damn, ten. And now I'm kind of just like, "Eh, you're getting to that Jackie O age and Kyle and Jackie O." Oh, yeah. I don't know, man. I'm still still think she's like I'm a vibing. teen. Yeah, you didn't have to put a number on it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, you're vibing it. Yeah, Saga definitely is. That's the only uh, situation where he'd be that close to a woman, that attractive. I know. <laughs> I like every that. time you always look at him, you're just like, "What?" <laughs> like Kyle and Crystal makes a little more sense, doesn't it? When, when uh, every time you ever that, see when they when they talk to each other, it just sounds like Kyle's very like kind of attracted to her. 
Yeah, I know. But like, I mean, they, they all can't help it. But you can't help it because she is clearly that hot. Yeah. But and then there's also it's it's exactly the same as when you see that Roman roaming millennial chick on those like. Turning point or whatever, like polit- politicon. She's always on those well, the, debates. The half Asian one. The half Asian yeah, one. She's very attractive. She's really like you know porcelain like, right? And and you can see it <laughs> with that. There's all these other like combative nerds on the stage, and no matter what she says, everyone's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. This is like, yeah, we all know why this is happening. If you if you if you get into the foray of of uh, political verbal pugilism you're dealing with incels okay you're dealing with guys who are probably not the most charismatic and popular with women so as soon as you put an attractive woman there they don't know how to handle it i know you know when you talk about, you- hell i probably wouldn't let's be honest but no you know, you know when um jordan peterson always makes that point about uh oh you know, I, I just don't know how to react if to a crazy woman because if it's a crazy man, there's a line you do not cross. Uh, I think similarly, there's also this kind of confusion when you're dealing with a woman that you may disagree with, but you're also attracted to, and and just in your mind, you you, you have this internal argument between your brain and your dick. Yeah, and it definitely happens. It's it's a weird situation to be in. But dude, that even happens. That even happens when you do agree with a chick that you think is hot. I think it's just the dick overrides, and you just become like a a, a pile of mess. Yeah, depending on uh, how viscerally you may disagree with them and what you disagree with them on. You know what it is. I, wonder I think if, it's you, just. Do you think women get that say, like with I don't know Justin Trudeau? Yeah, of course, dude. Like you saw. Uh, Actually, yeah. To be fair, Julia, when Julia Gillard um, met Obama, that's when you can't argue with the, the Murdoch press was like, oh, she was like a schoolgirl. She was. Yeah. She was fawning all over. Hell, who wouldn't? It's Obama. But yeah. It's... But it was like, like, who was it? Ivanka? Ivanka? Ivanka Trump. Like, she is one of the hottest women I've ever seen, right? But when she was in the same room with Justin Trudeau, she did exactly the same thing. I think it's just like well, everybody got- has like an internal status point in their head of I can't get a chick that's this attractive for whatever reason it is. It could be real. It could be imagined. But as soon as you hit someone that's in that class that is just well above you uh-huh. in status, you can't help but just fucking go to nothing. And I don't even think it's necessarily like sexual status either like okay dude every time i'm in the room with like kevin rudd for instance i'm always just like yeah mr kevin oh yeah that's mad like i just turn into like a 15 year old because it's just like he's the fucking former prime minister like who the fuck are you you know like there's just a status thing that like they just like your brain shrinks in on itself I wonder if everyone would react that way if they're in the room with Kevin Rudd, you know? Probably to some degree. Uh, He's obviously someone you look up to. And I wonder if that would also play a part. But status is is so vital and and so significant to human psychology. I don't think people realize. And I think it's it's actually a huge aphrodisiac for both men and women. And and you think it's something like beauty, or you think it's something like success, or you, you, it, it, which it go they go hand in hand. But it's really the status. It's the status of Justin Trudeau. It's it's the status of these otherwise hideous politicians that are then you know courting these uh, people who are completely out of their league. There's something about status that is so alluring, and we just we just intrinsically submit to someone who we deem higher status yeah yeah and there's like there's like a boundary in there i think there's a bound like there's 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 like a breaking point where it's just unquestionable they just did another level to you and then after that like I, i really can't describe it the only thing is that your brain just kind of turns to mush at that point and it is amazing that, uh-huh. like, a hot woman does that. 
<laughs> like, because there's there's Look really there. nothing more high status than that, is there? But I'm sure, you know, a Chris Hemsworth looking dude would do that too. Yeah, definitely. The thing is, I'd wonder, it would be a good experiment to have someone who looks like Chris Hemsworth versus someone, who, but then that person's also poor and uh, low status in in most uh, uh, areas. And then you compare that to someone who is extremely high status but traditionally unattractive. You put, you put that person next to, I don't know, Bill Gates. I wonder how people would react. I wonder how women would react. And similarly with a man, you put like a, a high status woman who's not traditionally attractive uh, and and pair them with a, a lower status woman who is very traditionally attractive, and the thing is, attraction actually plays into your status though. So that person, if they look like Chris Hemsworth or Margot Robbie, they're never going to actually be low status, even if they're living in a van. They have a a, a, a genetic status about them, so you can't say this person is low status, can you? Hmm. It definitely help because. I've definitely met that before. I've met bum surfies that live in combis and my brain turns to mush again because I'm kind of just like, dude, he's the ubermensch here. He's clearly yeah. the fucking alpha. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he doesn't have a penny to his name. He's poorly educated. It's just... Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes they're not even that attractive. There's just... Dude, it's such a hard thing such a hard like sometimes there's just undeniable traits like you know your position or attractiveness or wealth and these things kind of add up but there's also just this sort of x factor that i think kind of just comes to just being unapologetically comfortable with yourself i think that as soon as you see other people that are kind of like uncomfortable in a situation They're at least low status in that situation. Yeah, and it turns you off, doesn't it? You can't but, trust them. No. There are some people who are just natural leaders. But that, dude, like being an attractive woman, because that's they must just register that everywhere they go. Well, they say, where did I read this? Somewhere where, where girls pick up on whether they're pretty or not by age six. And it, Whoa. and it really determines how they view themselves. I can't remember where I heard that. Uh, but I don't have a reason to doubt it. It makes sense. Whereas I don't remember at six thinking, whoa, this guy's better looking than me. But I actually, do remember being actually, six. What? I do, you know, by year two and three, you do sort of start to gauge where you sit on the on the uh, popularity hierarchy. Mm. So, you know what? No, it's not, but... but with men, it, it, with boys, it's not just about the looks per se. It's about, well, dominance and uh, strength and uh, are you roughhousing with the other guys but coming out on top. I think at that age, that's really what's determining the status. Are you Even at that age, are you charismatic? And then also looks. And then if you've got all of those... As a guy, you just you're the full package, right? If you've got emotional intelligence, charisma, status, and looks, I mean, there's nothing you can't do in the world. No. Mm. Well, it's definitely the same case with women. But no, you definitely did get a. Yeah, I think that's it. I think the first time I was ever attracted to a girl, I think it would have been seven. Year two sounds about right. So I suppose mm, that's when you're like same. cognizant enough to know where not just you sit on the totem pole, but where other people sit on the totem pole. In my primary school, there was this like one girl who just monopolized all male attraction. Everyone had a crush on her. Everyone. And just it's the classic tale. In year six, she dated, you know, year six relationship. I don't know what that entailed, but she dated like the most <laughs> just stereotypical. I don't know if he was actually Lebanese, but like Middle Eastern dude, you could possibly imagine. Was he in year six? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was in year six as well. 
Uh, was he alpha? Yeah, I wouldn't actually say he would have been the most popular in our... Pro- oh, he was up there. He was up there. I'm trying to think now. It's been a while. Who was the most popular in our... There wasn't a clear top dog. Um, there were a few uh, sort of vying for that position, I'd say. But she was no, yeah. the alpha woman of our primary school. I think that's the case when it comes to guys. There's usually like three or four that are kind of just like in their own little tier. But you're right. Like there's one woman that gets about 80% of the attention. In our high school, this is this is actually a really interesting visual representation of what is it the Pareto principle right they had this thing called the hookups chart which they had in the year 12 common room uh where they just drew lines to everyone who hooked up these two guys that were just right in the center there and had lines to so many girls and then there were a few other guys on the edges that were also hooking up with the girls but these two guys in particular dominated the field Mm. Mm. What 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 would you say about them? Um, yeah, easily the po- the popular guys of our high school. Yeah, so charismatic, emotionally intelligent. All yeah 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 all the yeah yeah. So like you athletic came across looking. them and like you you thought like you know what I'm glad they're hooking up with all those chicks. Like you, you weren't just like those guys, but they suck. No, you weren't. You were just like you you, you expected it. Yeah, it was like a foregone conclusion. You got out of the way of greatness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that that's the same thing. I think that that's definitely like, if you are a leader of men, you really are a leader of men, aren't you? Like, it, all the other men know, yeah. Mm. Jordan's been talking about that a lot in his uh, in his podcast. Wow, this really took a incel turn, didn't it? Uh, his podcast about how the football captain is is sort of venerated to such a degree by the other men in the team. Well, not always the 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 man with the C next to his name, but the the leader, the top dog of that tribe, um, and they leech off his success, or they want him to be even more successful because the leader's success then well it makes sense, right? Because if the if the the leader of the wolf pack is is well fed. And and uh, has all possible advantages. It then benefits everyone else under his wing. More so than uh, to to the extent where could it even be evolutionarily adaptive that if you are not entirely low on the status chain, but you're sort of second third tier, it would be beneficial to give some resources to the top dog. Because the utility of those resources for the top dog will then benefit the whole tribe more. Whereas if you consume or utilize whatever those resources may be, uh, the utility to you pales in comparison to, to the utility to the whole tribe if the leader attains more resources. Do you think there's some sort of Darwinian um, truth to that? I mean, it does make a lot of sense, but the thing is, like, well, I suppose evolutionarily, yeah, but, like, in high school, where's the benefit? Well, it's just so embedded into our genetic code, It's just so embedded, yeah, that's it. And it's not as, it's not as simple as, you know, you're, like, allowing someone to take things from you. No, but there's but also there's like something a, about there's something about it, but like there's there's a certain guy that when they hook up with the girl that you have a crush on, you're always just like fuck them. And then there's another type of person that when they hook up with that girl, they're just like sorry, man, just uh, you just yeah, thanks, thanks for the solid man. And then they just go and you're just like yeah, yeah fair enough, yeah. <laughs> there is a guy where you're just uh, kind of like yeah, I was bested, whatever. Okay, yeah, uh, true. Ah. Uh, I'm definitely thinking there was two guys mm. in my school. There was one that was sporty and one that was like a rocker. And they usually do end into those two groups. And it does remind me of that theory that uh, in order to stop him breeding, there was two types of alphas. There's like the leader of the tribe alpha, which would have been the sporty one. And the sigma. <laughs> and the sigma. Yeah. 
Don't you think? Like, and that's the rocker one that's just sense. kind of like this free spirit, yeah? Like a Russell Brand kind of character that's just around us. Like, yes. You're beautiful, in it? Let's have a little makeup. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Let's get this other girl in there. And that's definitely weird, isn't it? Like, the, the <laughs> I mean, that's exactly how all these threesomes started. Do you reckon? Like, yeah. so many, like, throwing around of like, this so is fun. crazy. This is yeah. insane. It has been so much fun uh, <laughs> to be a part of that. <laughs> Yeah, they're the two stereotypes of the, the, the men who are successful in the sexual domain. And in my experience, they ring true. Uh, they It usually is the, yeah, the alpha type and the sigma type that seem to be the most successful uh, in uh, chasing, well, in, uh, yeah, gaining mates. Actually, going to do a podcast on Sigma males with Eliza this weekend. Well, what are your thoughts on it? It seems kind of true. I don't think it's a sort of dangerous idea, as some people would say, or is it's 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 some kind of outlet for incel resentment. There, I think there just are certain certain uh, uh, psycho social, biological truths that even with this uh, advanced digital civilization we live in, we still revert to and we still have elements of and we are a deeply social species and we're an animal at the end of the day and a major need for an animal is to mate and there are going to be uh, certain norms and behaviors embedded into our genetic code that have evolved over hundreds and mil- hundreds and hundreds of millions of years that we can't avoid and they will manifest in interesting ways in human society because our society is so different to other natural animal environments so i think there is a certain truth to those archetypes otherwise why would they what they just they don't just come out of thin air hmm not someone who just invented the alpha male and the sigma male and just put it out there into the onto four chan. I'm sure there would have been some truth to those basic concepts. And sure, maybe then by spreading a, a, awareness of those ideas, it actually exacerbates the existence of those ideas within the community. But in my experience, uh, those two archetypes seem to exist i seem to see traits uh, of those two particular characters emulated in men who are uh, sexually successful if we want to say that so i think there's a, a a deep biological truth to some of these archetypes i don't think they're just something that incels invented and I don't see how they're harmful either. I don't see how it's harmful to maybe just say, all right, in that situation, that guy seemed kind of alpha, or in this, this situation, this guy seems kind of sigma. I think when it comes to resentment towards women, uh, saying, well, we'll just go for the alphas and, and don't like the nice guys, then that's... It's harmful. It's also just uh, restrictive, and it's probably harmful to the person holding those beliefs more than anything else. Look, it's definitely like... The, the, the difference is, though, I think what it... Look, I, I could be completely off the mark about this. Is a sigma describing a man that's a genius? Is it describing someone who's like an okay. Einstein? Okay. My in, admittedly uh, shout, superficial understanding right now about a sigma male is someone who's a lone wolf, whereas an alpha man is the leader of the pack. Yeah. So an alpha yeah, male would be yeah. the football captain and the sigma male would be that uh, mysterious rock star. who just, Broody. Yeah, who just lives his own path, uh, lives his own life, walks his own path, I should say. Whereas, yeah, the alpha is someone who's probably more of the extrovert who's around men a lot more and has just naturally taken his position as the, the Simba of whatever given 
uh, <laughs> group he's in. <laughs> <laughs> and the Sigma is the guy who just... Isn't interested. No, he doesn't, doesn't want to participate. He's an introvert uh, and he... I tell you what, like the only thing that I think makes it really sad is that I think that, and and makes me think that there's, I'm trying to like look more truth into it, is I can see why the Sigma male has taken off. And it's because when I look at it, I'm kind of just like, yeah, 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 that's that's me. I I was never the alpha, but I'm still, I'm still cool, right? Like, I think that's what's happening with the Sigma male. And I think that's why... You know, it's it's taken off in 4chan realms and shit like that. Because it's kind of... Makes I suppose sense. that's it. It's kind of like the ide- idealized version of an introvert. That's it. And and an alpha yeah. is an idealized version of an extrovert. Yeah. It, 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 it's a lot easier for someone to uh, identify as a sigma male if they're a loner. Because it's, a lo- it's probably a lot harder to become an alpha male. Because you can't just force yourself uh, into the leadership position. You have to sort of subversively and indirectly be gifted that position. Whereas yes. a sigma just can be anyone. But if the alpha, if it is, yes, true, true. Uh, the thing is, though, that it would kind of become natural to them. Because that's the whole you thing. You like, work for it too. You definitely have to work for it. But if, if you are destined to be an alpha... You're going to be an alpha, and it would just feel like, you know, a duck in water. Sure, you'd f- like when when you're at parties, when you're, you know, at doing sport and stuff like that. You you'd enjoy the process. Yeah. Whereas if you're more on that sigma side and the introverted side, like, cause dude, I always remember that. I was always just like, fuck, I hate going to parties, and it was never like a thing of being like, I'm scared. It wasn't that. It was just like this thing of like. This is, uh, well, you, you know, like it was, I'm scared when I was like a teenager or whatever, but you grow out of that and then you just kind of like, this is a waste of time. It was exactly the same as you. I went because I felt like I had to. But it I'm never like, felt natural. This is, this is lame. I would make fun of everyone who went to the party. And then I never got invited to a party from year 10 to year 12 because I faked being drunk because I was like, <laughs> that's the like <laughs> brutal comedian in me even from that age where... I would look around and these people are retarded. And then I'm like, oh, oh, man, good party, man. I'm so drunk. I hooked up with 10 girls. Wow, I'm so cool, dude. And like that just disinvited me to the next, <laughs> next two years worth of party. <laughs> and then by the time I started going to parties again in year 12, I hadn't caught up uh, with my limits of alcohol. So I was the idiot getting super drunk at the year 12 parties when everyone was saying, oh, oh cute little Neil doesn't know his limits. Yeah, oh, yeah. he's so wasted. So it, it, I actually, I think I made a pretty alpha move at that first party saying, Fuck you guys. This is lame as fuck. It didn't pay off, but <laughs> took the risk, didn't get the reward. I don't know how it would pay off. Well, everyone's like, yeah, you're so true. This is lame. We're going to stop drinking now. <laughs> what was I thinking? Yeah. It's, it's, but again, it's like the fact that you were thinking that shows that that was never going to be a path for you. I was never going to be. No, I've never been. Uh, yeah. Of course. Anyone who listens to this podcast would probably guess if anyone's a Sigma or like emulates certain characteristics of the Sigma, yeah, I live alone. I've always been a fucking loner. I do everything I just just in solitude. I don't like groups. I don't even like collaborating often. You know, I collaborate with you, Analyzer, and then that's it. Fuck off, everyone else. <laughs> mm. So... Yeah, I, I, you're more of an alpha because you've got a whole team around you. No, but I'm exactly the same. Like, there's sure. just constant okay. this, like... In the artistic world, you'll find, you won't find many alpha men, okay? That's why we're probably going to gravitate be towards... Who the fuck is? Yeah, comedy and, and things like commentary. In, in, in the sporting world you, that, and, and in the business world, and that's where you'll find the, the hardened alphas and the army. The general of the army should be the leader of the pack. Should be. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. It's just like, okay, are you 
are you adept in social situations? Does that feel natural to you? If you are, then like I suppose you should be looking towards emulating those alpha male traits, but it just never... Because that's the whole thing. Like, yeah, commentary, comedy, these are all extremely solitary pursuits. It takes like a long, long time of like endless introspection. And the thing is, never get tired of it either. Never get tired of it. But I get tired of talking to fans. (laughs) I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Uh, Not that I don't want to do it, but I... No, but there's just something internally where you're just kind of like, I'm out of batteries. Yeah. But there's no battery to like writing oh, I or lo- performing or anything like that. I liked lockdown. Yeah, me too. Like, so me I'm, I'm, to I'm scared of things opening up again. Yeah, put my head more in, in, in what I was reading and, and the uh, content I was producing. I actually like the solitude of being on stage because you, you, you're in your own world there. Well, you know what else is interesting about that? Don't you think that there's a point and it was something that kind of just intrinsically shifted in my mind. Like I think that that was the point when I started realizing like there was a, I was, I was getting better at stand up. Was there was kind of like this shift in your mind of fuck, I am alone up here. Yeah. And then the audience's response, like, just didn't matter so much anymore. Like, as, as what you were saying, like, it kind of shifted from, like, fuck, I've got to entertain these people to, like, no, nah, I'm in my own world. Mm, they're not atomized people anymore. It's an organism. It's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's an art form. Yeah. It's not communicating in a one-on-one situation. Uh, it's a very solitary profession. I mean, ironically enough, I think I was talking to... When I did the interview with Dave Rubin, I was talking to him afterwards and he said a big reason why he actually moved into the commentary space and and stopped stand-up is that it is so, it can be just uh, unbearably lonely because in com- compared to musicians and even actors who are usually working with other people, even the, 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 the sole musician... And when I say so, S O L E, they usually they might have a guitarist, or they have a backing band, or they have they're traveling with people. Often, and if they're at a really big level, uh, they've got their managers, and sure, comedians have that too. But there's something really solitary about the uh, peripatetic comedian who is trying to make strangers laugh. Then go home to a motel in the middle of bumfuck nowhere and probably jack off. Yeah. That's the life that of is a the comedian. Life. There's no glamour for the true road dog. And you, that's why you res- that's why comedians respect the comedian's comedian. There's no glamour in that. Nah. It's performing for the people who are already masters of the craft. It's being the alpha. Of the the sigmas, hey, you can put it that way, right? Because the comedian's comedian is the guy who turns his back or her back on uh, the fanfare, the money, the glamour, the glitz to just perfect the craft and perform in dingy pubs and bars all across the country, uh, living paycheck to paycheck. You know what else as well? You can really see it in the difference between Dave Chappelle and Patrice O'Neill. And I do actually think that Ooh, if you're talking yeah, about the true yeah. comedian, it is him as opposed to Dave. Like Dave is always talking about how he gave up $50 million, but he gave up enough to get into Chappelle's show in the first place. Whereas Patrice O'Neill was offered that life and then he just went, no. Damn, maybe you know? Dave's still really trying to be the comedian's comedian. He's trying to like earn the peers' respect because for a lot of comedians, once they hit the uh, the realm of the commercial, I get it, the TV show, or the, it would have been the sitcom back then. And now it's once they get go viral on the internet. The comedy world can... It's not like turning their back on you, but you, you, you're no longer in the conversation for the, the comedian, for being the comedian's comedian. You can obtain a little bit of success, not too much success. Like Doug Stanhope, he's successful, not too successful. 
Mm. And then you can still be in that realm of the comedian's comedian. It's mm. a very revered position for for uh, within the comedy community. Everyone mm. else will be like, I don't give a fuck. Who are these people? But actually, Louis is someone who was uh, probably one of the f- few who was able to do bo- both, achieve commercial success and be the comedian's comedian. But have you noticed, dude, ever since he was cancelled, fuck, he's funny now. Like, his new one, the one he did uh, that he released on his website was was it was vintage Louis. He hasn't lost uh, any of his rhythm or timing or any of his mastery. He's, he's just as good as he was. But again, there's this thing of like he's not he's not appealing. This is the thing, right? Like to be a comedian's comedian, you you have to be as pure as possible to the idea that you aren't trying to appeal to anything. As soon as you become like a commercial success as a comedian, you have to appeal to a bunch of different like interests. But that's mm. definitely what happened with Louis C.K. Like as soon as he like all the money was taken away, you can see as you were saying, like he just went back to vintage Louis. And I actually think the best stand up that I've ever heard of him was when he first came back after the beat off incident. And was performing just to a club and was just testing out that hour that he actually put out. And that was the best thing. That was the best one. And so, yeah, he has gone back to that position, I suppose, of comedian's comedian. Mm. Because he's, he's, he's not... That's the whole... You know what comedian's comedian is? It's like purely... It's purely in it for the joke. That's what it is. It's just it's it's a pure yep. pursuit of of making an audience laugh. N- nothing else. There's no other. There's no other agenda there. The only reason that they they have like their their comments and they talk about things is like I do truly think this now that I'm a bit older. I think that when you have something to hang the joke off, the joke has more of an impact. Whereas sure. if you just do that pure joke thing, if you just get up. You do punchline, punchline, punch. It gets old. Like watching an hour of punchlines is old. The reason that you have like a perspective in between it is to give the audience a rest so the joke lands better. It's also unique to that particular joke because so many jokes you can just assume have been said before, but when you add that extra perspective... It can uh, make it notably unique because we both agree on on what ideal comedy is. It's 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 finding being able to articulate an unspoken, implicitly agreed upon truth in a hilarious way, and and using that comedy to either lampoon or criticize certain accepted norms that you weren't even aware were accepted before. And so the best comedy does, it makes you laugh significantly, but it also, it's such a cliche, but it also does make you think. It makes you come out of the show being, it's not that it makes you, See where that's been bastardized is it is that comedians try to sound smart by just saying things that they know are just sort of heuristic signs to to allow the audience to understand that they're smart. Mm. So it, rather than just doing a dick joke, you say, "Well, this con- conservative politician has a small dick, and here's my dick joke." Oh, that guy's smart. He knows about politics, right? Because you haven't actually offered any interesting perspective there. But yeah. When Bill Burr comes out and says, "There's no reason to hit a w- woman," what do you mean? There's no reason? And then just masterfully crafts a series of jokes around that premise that is so jarring when you first hear it to then leave the listener actually confused in a good way to have their reality challenged through laughter is 
truly genius. Yeah, fuck you, right? Like if if Jesus. Yeah, it was like Doug Stanhope just. Oh, uh, he he's got jokes on kids with cancer. He's got jokes about him aiding his mum's suicide. That is what dark, truly good dark comedy is. It's not just saying something obtuse and offensive for the sake of it, for the shock value. It's saying something profound about something that is otherwise taboo. And and Doug Stanhope is, is the master of that. Yeah, you're right, actually. It's kind of... Uh... The reason it's so funny that what that you you know what it is. There's also like another third element to this, of like these cliches that are kind of like, but but they're undeniable. And the other one is he's saying what we're all thinking. And if you are, if you're that comedian that's true, able to like, true. you know, you, you like everyone's thinking that that thought, but everyone's too scared to say it. And if you get somebody up there that's just like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it. And I'm, I'm going to make it digestible enough. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I think that is a good note to end our centenary podcast on. Wow, that was pretty cool, actually, because it was just kind of like a summation of all. You don't need to watch any of our other episodes. That was it. It's pretty much yeah. just the summary of the hundred. Wow. <laughs> we just covered all the topics we usually talk about, right? Yes. Stand up, incels, politics. Alphas. Alpha. <laughs> Pussy. And what else is there to talk about? What else is there? I think that's it, yeah. Well, thank you for 100 episodes, guys. I hope you enjoyed that very special centenary edition. That when, Oh, look at that. Two hours and 40 minutes. We're not splitting that in two, okay? That's, that's just going to be the unique centenary two-hour, 40-minute podcast back together. Subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll go back to some questions and topics next week. Thank you so much for listening, for coming on this journey with us, and we uh, hope you stick around for 100 more. Thank you. See you guys. <laughs>